Go ahead and bring that music down. Obviously, it's uh, Glenn Clark Radio. It's a Tuesday edition of the program. Um, look, man. Um, I I am I'm at a loss the same way that the rest of you are. Um, and and I at this moment don't know that there's any you know direct. Um, impact for me and and someone that I know, someone that's part of my life. And I think that a lot of us are still sort of feeling that today. We're going to do a show today. We're going to get there and we're going to talk about sports because that's what we do. And we we wouldn't be qualified if you're looking for 24-7 updates from this morning's tragedy on the Key Bridge, then... We're assuming that you're looking elsewhere. We don't have a news team, unfortunately, that we can send out. We are all feeling much of the same as to what you're feeling. And it's shock, and it's sadness, and it's devastation, and it's overwhelming. And and it, and it touches on every aspect of emotion there's the confusion the do do we know who was on the bridge do we know if someone we love was involved in the tragedy in in some tragic events you can have an awareness of who was who was there who was present Hor- horrifyingly in this country when a shooting occurs at a school well, we largely know who was in the school building at the time we have no idea who may have been driving on the bridge I'm sure many of you thought about people that you know that regularly take the bridge early in the morning but you know I think about when I was a young man and whether I was, you know, going to see a buddy or something like that, is it possible? I, I, I will acknowledge I did not drive the key bridge as frequently as others do. That side of town, you know, Dundalk and eastern Baltimore County, into Anne Arundel County, that's not where I was from. I never worked in that part of town. I I, I not frequently, not on a day to day basis. So while I didn't drive it as often as other people did, I, I certainly think it's possible that I, you know, one day could have been. And that's part of the difficulty that we're having today is that we kind of like to know that everybody that we know, everybody that we care about is safe, but we know that some aren't, including construction workers that were working on the bridge. So the confusion is a major part of it the sadness of already knowing that lives were lost. We might not know exactly who they were yet, but we know lives were lost. Many. Which is gutting. Uh, An event this tragic, I, I, I don't know single events, in the history of our state that will prove to be as devastating as this will prove to be just from the human loss of life. And even without knowing who those souls are, just the the fear and the, the horror that goes along with that is overwhelming. And then, of course, there's all of the follow-up that, you know, in a way feels trite to even be thinking about, but that's the way the human brain operates. You can't help but think about it. You can't help but think about the fact that the Key Bridge is a symbol of our city and our community. Yeah, It's something that we are familiar with, that we associate with. It's part of who we are. It's a cultural touchstone in Baltimore. The idea of the physical bridge 
not being present is is empty it's an empty feeling it's something we associate with we have memories of you know it's it 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 pales in comparison to the loss of human life but it's still real it's still something we we see and we acknowledge and it's part of our lives and the concept of it not being there is is something we don't we just can't fathom and and it's hard to avoid you know for many people thinking about the next steps right like well how does this affect my life now and then you feel terrible about that because well obviously that means nothing in comparison to lives that have been lost but it's who we are as a society we can't help it we can't help but go there what will this mean for the city what will this mean for the port what will this mean for the economy what will this mean for all of those things of course you know that they don't matter in the same way that the actual tragedy matters but we're human and that's the way the human mind operates is you just start going through step by step by step in the process. I, I think that it's important, a few things that I, I did, you know, for what what can we do, because there's a strong what can we do feeling in these moments, and I don't have those answers yet. I I hope. Obviously, your your heart is with those rescue workers and those responders the divers that are in the water today, the people who are doing everything in their power, even if they can't save the lives of those that were impacted, these families deserve to have these bodies recovered, even if they're not with us any longer. And so you're you're grateful for the humans that will be going and diving into have already obviously been diving into cold water today in desperate search you know praying for the miracle of somehow there being another survivor or survivors but recognizing that might not be what they're looking for and they're just trying to retrieve someone for someone's family you're grateful for those people and everything that they do and the training that they put in to be prepared for these moments. The totality of that is, you know, again, overwhelming. I'm most certainly not that heroic. But there is that feeling of what can we do? What, how do we help? Because it feels powerless today. You're watching these ima- you're seeing these images and, and you just want to do something. This is our city. This is our community. Um, I don't know if you heard the mayor during at least one, if not more of his media uh, appearances this morning, asked the networks to stop showing the video repetitively. And I appreciated what he was trying to say. At some point, it goes from a matter of record to a matter of sensationalism. You're watching the moment of death. I understand the surreal nature of the bridge's collapse has newsworthiness. But it's in the record now. We're aware of it. You know, when people were waking up today, they might not have been. Obviously, if they're waking up, they weren't. But we know now. It's time to stop. It's time to stop sharing the video. The video, if you're not able to think this way, you've got to remember that there are human beings involved. And you are watching the end of someone's life in that moment. So I, 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 I agree with the mayor. It's not just about the, n- the networks. I think it's about all of us. At some point, 
it's just pure sensationalism to continue to share the video. We're aware of what happened. We're aware of what occurred. It's devastating. We don't need to keep sharing it for attention. We have an attention problem. When something like this occurs, it plays the worst of us. We, we want to be the one. You come, to, come to my Facebook page to talk about this. Come to my... Stop it. Stop. We don't need to keep sharing the video. We have to remember this is a tragedy. I would add the conspiracy theory stuff. The, 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 the people that, there are people that are truly bad actors. There are other people that are just like, dude, I, I just think it's okay to ask questions. I, I understand to some extent the way that you feel. I, I would say you could wait. You could wait. Again, you're dealing with the moment that lives were lost. You don't need this. You don't... Go for a walk. Go donate blood. Go do something productive. Say, I'm just asking questions. Go see the lady, you know? Like, go... It's not helpful. I, I, I'm... There will be an investigation, and however you feel about conspiracies, cover-ups, things along those lines, I can't help you. Today, not the day. And in a tragedy of this scale, I would probably say there's never a day. There just nev- there never is. Um... I, you want to you want to think about it privately. You want to have that in the back of your mind, man. Go right ahead, but there are people that are grieving today, and will be grieving for the rest of their lives. I I don't know what you think you're adding to it. If you're an investigative journalist, and you know you, I don't, I, I just. I'm not I'm not trying to be a you know I oh, always never doubt anything ty I just it's not come on man what are we adding today how's that helping somebody you don't know anything and the evidence to this point certainly makes it appear as though this was an accident an ungodly unfathomable accident So I would say those are the only two things right now that I can think of at, at some point. I, I, I think it always helps to consider donating blood. I'm not sure how it would help in this particular tragedy because this is not like, you know, obviously the loss of life will be from drowning, from hypothermia, things along those lines. I, I would still suggest that if you feel the need to do something, as so many of us do in these moments. It's never a bad idea to go donate blood. There's always a need. Always a need. Even if it's not for this particular event, there will be other events and there will be more need for blood. If you just want to do something, if you just have that feeling of doing something, it's always something that there is a need for. I don't know. I'm woefully unprepared to tell you about anything else that you can do in the immediacy to try to help. There will be a long road ahead for the city. I I, I could sense in the press conferences this morning when questions were already being asked about rebuilding, how are you possibly prepared for that? I mean, there are days where you want to get after politicians. I get it. Like, almost across the board. 
I get it. But, like, my God, a bridge just went down. There's no playbook for that. There's no, well, here's what we do in these situations. It's going to take, you know, an unprecedented effort moving forward. But right now, you can't even go there because you're still trying to pull bodies out of the water. And you don't even know how many you're looking for. So I I understand the your brain. I my brain goes there too. You're not evil because you're thinking about that. It's just the way we function, the way we operate. You're not evil if your first thought was I I I, I would say going to social media and talking about how you drive on the bridge I don't think it's adding a lot today. I get it. I think everybody goes there, but it really does feel more like, how do I make a tragedy about me? And and feels a little tasteless. I understand thinking about it, but I think it can stop at the thinking about it. We all think about it. We're all thinking about times that we've driven. When was the last time I was on the Key Bridge? For me, it was going down to visit... Um, Mo's mom, actually, I think. Like, we all think about it. It all crosses our mind. But trying to make it about us, we are not the victims of this tragedy. Um, I don't think I have a lot more to say about it. I, I don't. My heart obviously is torn into pieces and it is with everyone impacted by just an unfathomable tragedy. And I, I, I pray for miracles and I, I, I don't know what else there is to say. Let, let's... um. Just for a second, like as I was driving in, I, I thought, well, how do we do sports today? Like it just doesn't feel like a day where my buddy Matt Torper and I were messaging this morning. Is like, boy, it really puts Jackson Holiday into perspective. Like yesterday I'm angry about Jackson Holiday, and, and look, we're going to talk about Jackson Holiday today. I, it's what I said at the beginning. Like I, I, I am, hi, Glenn Clark, merely adequate man. I am not capable of providing the amount of context or m- my words cannot change anything. More important men and women than I can't do that. I'm just a guy. We do sports. That's what we do. Um, and it, if today you're not, you know, you're not here because you're invested in the new we get it i understand i if you say hey glenn i i tuned in and now i'm going to check out and i'm going to go watch continuous coverage of i i get it i really do i understand i can't do that for you i just can't so for the rest of the show, we're going to do what we do. We're going to do sports coverage, and we're going to talk about the Orioles, and we're going to talk about the NCAA tournament and the Ravens, and that's what we do here. We're a magazine show for Press Box. So that's where this show is going to go the rest of the way, but it doesn't, it doesn't change where our hearts out are. Um... And and the emotions that we feel on a day like today. So that's that. That's what I've got for you. All right. We'll get into some sports conversation here momentarily. Uh, it is a Tuesday edition of Glenn Clark Radio. Today's show is brought to you by Superbook. I was wondering if the line's are already up for opening day. I don't think so. I'm going to assume not. Oh, Oh, I was wrong. Line is up. 
Orioles are minus 180 favorites for what we believe will be a Thursday opening day. We're hoping for that. They're minus 180 favorites. The uh, run total for the game is set at 7.5. Get to Superbook.com, download the Superbook app, use the code GlennClark23 when you sign up. You'll receive up to $250 in a same-day first bet match, win or lose, from Superbook. So, we were talking, obviously, we spent much, much of yesterday's show talking about Jackson Holiday. I happened to catch a little bit of um, our next guest and Scott Braun discussing Jackson Holiday on Foul Territory yesterday, and he is not worked up about Jackson Holiday going down to Norfolk. I reference, I really enjoyed um, his book, Town of the Backup Catcher. I reference it a lot. I've, I've referenced it recently with uh, Matt Weeders and with Buck. I, I just really enjoyed that book. Joining us now, one of the hosts of Foul Territory, his former MLB catcher, Eric Kratz, and he's with us now here on GCR. Eric, it's Glenn. It's great to chat with you, man. Thank you so much for taking a couple of minutes for us this morning. Yeah, no doubt. Hearing that intro, it feels like I want to say thank you, and I feel like there's also like a, but now I disagree well, with you. Well, I, kind of I, I, so okay, I'm so excited about this. Eric, I do, but I really respect you. And so I am, like, I, I try to do this when we do interviews. Like, we don't do ambush type of stuff. I, I do want to no talk more through what it is that you, you think because your way of thinking and your brain, I, I really appreciate your way of thinking. I'm I'm in a weird place with this where I will acknowledge I don't think it's the end of the world, right? Like, I don't think this proves that the Orioles are incompetent or they can't win or anything along those lines. But the sheer nature of is whatever the trade-off of Jackson Holiday trying to improve a little bit more, is that worth the potential trade-off for at the end of the year, you might not even get the extra year of service time, and you might be missing out on a top 35 draft pick if he ends up being as good as most people seem to think he's going to be. Can I make that make sense in my head, and I'm struggling with that part of it? Okay, well, do you trust the player development of the Orioles who have created a Westberg, a a Rutschman, a... Mm -hmm. Gunnar Henderson, uh, you know, all that player development. So do you trust them? Largely, yes. Largely. I, I, I don't know that I'm in a – I think a lot of people try to use that as like a disqualifier, like, hey, you know, it, it's it's 100 for 100. I still have questions about, like, why isn't Connor Norby here at this point, right? Like, I still have questions about some of what they do development-wise, but more than I don't, yes, I, I do trust yeah. them. You have more trust in their player development than you do in their ability to sign free agents, yeah, correct? That that is definitely fair. <laughs> it's definitely okay, fair. so you have to trust a organization that sees a twenty year old, newly minted twenty year old, about three months ago, December I think fourth was his birthday. A newly minted twenty year old that's been in front of these coaches' eyes, granite. Each coach that saw him only saw him for two months. So the coordinators probably saw him for the most because he went two months, two months, two months at each level, not even two months, like a month and a half. And then they saw the big league staff sees him play second base in big league spring training. And I go across all the way across the country to LA where everyone's saying Mookie Betts, he can play shortstop. I think what he did is amazing. Absolutely. Great story. Unbelievable. Is he a big league shortstop? And right now, I would think that maybe the Orioles, based on their decision, don't think that Jackson Holiday is a big league second baseman currently because he hasn't gotten enough reps. Like in spring training, let's say he played in, I'm just guessing, 15 games. If he got 15 ground balls or double plays at second, I would be surprised. And so those reps are actually legitimate. To me, this is because of the new rules. They're incentivized to call him up if he's ready. And so I would have to say, and I hear this all the time from front offices, I should have listened to the people that saw him the most. And to me, he's 20 years old. He can still be in the big leagues halfway through the year if that's what he needs. Norfolk is not 
it's not like he's going to Syracuse, New York, or Paul Tuckett, where it's going to be freezing cold. Norfolk's going to be very similar to what it is in Baltimore. So he's ready to go. He's close to Baltimore. This isn't detrimental to his career, and I don't think it's detrimental to the Orioles' season either, in a sense that they have the pieces there that will win, you know, will win them the games that they need to win. Will Jackson Holiday help? Absolutely. Turning a double play is bigger than fielding a ground ball, and that's, that's my biggest thing. If they don't think he's ready, I think the rules for service time manipulation have been completely – I think they're a success. Oh, I think we're seeing that around baseball, right? I think that's why it's so shocking to me is because you're looking at almost every other, you know, the Colt Keats of the world and the Wyatt Langfords of the world, the Jackson Merrills of the world. They're all in the big leagues to start the season. Like, this is the one that isn't happening. So I do agree with that part of it. And I, I think it's fair to say that the only reasonable argument is that it's it's a baseball-related decision that they're making. So I, I, I go to that to say, is that something that you have to do at the minor league level, though, right? Like, and I, and I ask that question, Eric, because, for example, we presume that because Jackson Holiday is not here, it's going to be, say, Jordan Westberg who's going to go over and play second. Ramona Rios, who struggled defensively a year ago, is going to play third. Like, I, I, Jordan Westberg is going to be your third baseman at some point. Don't you want to get him comfortable at third base? Do, do, do you have to do this? at the minor league level, or could it not be the end of the world, again, with the possible trade-off of being a top 35 pick, to let him do this in the major leagues in April and see if he's comfortable a couple weeks into the season? Okay, so the top, like, the best outcome, the best scenario is you get a top 30, you get 35 draft pick. That is meaning Jackson Holiday is everything we think he's going to be. You have to also look at the other side. Jackson Holiday struggles at a keystone position, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Do you send him down at the end of April? What does that do? I personally know Jackson. I know that does not affect him. Right. I assume the organization knows that does not affect him. So I'm less inclined to think they're worried about needing to send him down. And – Getting those reps in the minor leagues, I am – if you needed – if you told me he needed to get swings in the minor leagues, I would say, what are you talking about? Right. Swings in AAA, swings in AAA do not make a player's development other than, you know, their approach at the plate. And this guy's dad was an awesome big league player. He clearly knows approach at the plate, all that stuff. But we're talking about defense. So if the organization feels like they already have a below-average def- defender in Ramon Arias at third base, then you don't want to throw another average de- or below-average defender currently at second base. Because second base is routinely – like, who's the best defensive second baseman in the league right now? Uh, it's a good question. I actually don't know. I, uh... It takes a while to figure it out. Yeah. And I, because I'm a junkie, but after after Jimenez, Andre Jimenez from right, Cleveland, Cleveland yeah. who's been up there for years, there's some pretty brutal defensive second basemen in the sense that they hit, but they don't really field the ball. So it's really, to me, about getting those reps of turning that double play and being able to do that in, efficiently enough I'd be surprised if I don't see Jackson up in the big leagues like you. So let me, let me – by the way, Eric Kratz is with us here on GCR. Let me follow up with two questions. He he barely played second base in the minor league. Is it at all – when we talk about the trust we have, is it at all fair to ask, hey, if this was going to be an issue and this was the plan, why wasn't he playing more second base last season to start getting – like you knew that Frazier was only here for a year – you knew you had Gunnar Henderson entrenched at this point. Is it fair to question why he wasn't playing more second base a year ago? I mean, I guess it's fair. You also have to look at it in a context of stuff comes at you really fast in the season. Like, he has been with the Orioles for, for one full season. It's not like, right. oh, why, did we waste, why did we waste the last few years 
and, and I'll and I'll even say this, and people may not believe me, but I heard rumblings, and they never really got any farther of trading Jackson Holiday for Shohei Otani last year before Shohei got hurt. So, do you move Jackson Holiday to second base two minutes before teams? And I know if that's if that's who called, I know other teams probably called and said, hey, you know, we'd love to have Jackson Holiday. Well, everybody would love to have Jackson Holiday. Like, there's no, like, you sit there and you go, oh, actually, yeah, you could have Jackson. We actually have been playing him at second base for the last 10 games in the minor leagues. To me, the season was too short. I, I, don't, I don't think you can look back on it and go, oh, they should have done this sooner because they didn't know how he was going to do in double A in July when he got called up to double A. <laughs> They didn't know how he was going to do in AAA when he got called up in August in AAA. So that, that, that would, that's not against the organization. Um, the, let me, let, I, I expand this out, right? I, I say all of this to say I still think the Orioles are really good. And to the point, I think they're going to be even better when Jackson Holiday does arrive. It, yep. Do you think there's at all an impact on, on anyone else, like, that, hey, they're asking this question. Like, you hear from all of the players last week, we think this kid's a stud, we think he's great, all of that sort of... Do you think there's any potential negative impact at all on this clubhouse? Like, hey, are, are, are they thinking about whether or not this is service time manipulation and creating, you know, trust issues between the club and these players? That's a good question. I, I don't necessarily think so because i mean i think the players view i mean it came to fruition in in baltimore with gunner like gunner saw what happens when you get called up right away the organization gets you know their pick they he gets his his bonus for being called up right away and so i don't think it creates an issue i think players i think players are pretty good evaluators of their teammates and they can say whether or not I think this guy's ready to go. I think this guy is big league ready and will help our club this year. And that would be a question for, for Gunnar Henderson. Yeah, that would be a question yeah. for Adley Ruck, you know, to me, the de facto leaders of this team and Cedric Mullins, does he, does he, want him up there so that would be the only place that i would say i'm not saying they're making the decision i'm saying that would be the only reason if those guys are like what the heck what's going on with this why are they not calling them up like and you hear some griping from them okay you know then then i would start to be like okay they they think this guy's ready because they see him day in and day out like right. i prefaced the whole fernando tatis 2019 eric hosmer manny machado and i think another veteran went into the clubhouse, went into the manager's office and said, we need to, we need to have Fernando Tatis on the team to start the season. Yeah, they were going to service time, manipulate him. And yeah. the organization's preller said, call him up. Yep. And, you know, you saw what he did. So you'd think there would be more uprising if his teammates felt like this was unjust. And I haven't heard anything yet. This is obviously brand new news, though. Before I let you go, Eric, and I know you got a show to do today. Just the baseball season is going to start this week, and we are still fired up here in Baltimore yeah. about it. Um, is this a World Series winning caliber roster that the Baltimore Orioles have this season? Yes, one hundred percent. I think they need to address their their deep depth depth in the bullpen. Picking up Kimbrel is huge. If Kimbrel was 2016 Kimbrel, it would be, it would be still needing more depth. It would be, you know, you need your, you need your second, you, you need your third guy in that bullpen. And I think, I think somebody down there can step up. I think this team has the ability to withstand injuries that are going to happen. Any team that says, ah, oh, they were decimated by injuries. That just means they ain't calling anybody up from the minor leagues that can help. The Orioles have that box check. They have Adley Rutschman. I am the second biggest Adley Rutschman fan <laughs> in the world because I'm sure his, his mom or dad are bigger than me. But <laughs> when, you, when you have a catcher in the ilk of Buster Posey behind the dish that wins, 
just wins. He, that's what he does. He goes out there, wins, whether it's clubhouse culture, whether it's ability to hit from both sides of the plate, whatever. You have the opportunity to year in and year out be in the World Series. And I think that depth in the bullpen, because they don't have Bautista. If they have Bautista, to me, they are the favorite to win the World Series. Wow. They do not have a shut. I mean, hey, look, most teams don't have a shutdown close. Right. Okay. Right. Like, like Bautista. Like, you, you're you got to compare apples to apples. Yeah, it was historic you know, what he was doing. Correct. Historic. And I think Cano can step up. The issue is when Kimbrell has his bump in the road, which most above average closers have bumps in the road. They're not the elite closers. He's not an elite closer anymore. He will have an incredible season. But when he has a bump in the road, who's going to come in and step up and punch out two or three guys in a big spot in the middle of June? Because Cano has got tremendous, tremendous movement. He is going to get ground ball city, which is another reason you need your defense really, really solidified. And he's not, you know, you need to, you need a guy to come in and be able to strike out at least a batter an inning. And he's below that average does not mean he is not a good pitcher. It just means that you need to find that guy. And to me, if you find that guy in your own bullpen, then, then this team is not only favored in the East, I think they're favored in the American League because the American League doesn't have that super team like the National like the National League has has the Braves and the Dodgers. And this year's or last year's experience in the playoffs is only going to make an yeah. Adley Rutschman more hungry and more focused and knowing what they need to do. And to me, I see this team as like a 2015 Royals when we lost in 14 there was a bunch of young guys that understood what it meant to win in the biggest stage and took it all the way in 15 and won the World Series yeah I, Eric I was really good right up until you brought up the 2014 playoffs I was really enjoying this conversation appreciate it I just that's I, why I brought it yeah, up thanks a lot jerk <laughs> thanks a lot uh, at Eric Kratz 31 on Twitter is how you follow him. Of course, Foul Territory, which is awesome. And I'm telling you, man, I really did. I love the book. Um, it was very, very insightful. Appreciate you spending some time with us today. Would love to do this again. No doubt. Anytime. And, and anytime I can talk to anybody from Baltimore, including Adam Jones, who's on yeah, our show once yeah, a week. Yeah, he's the best, isn't I he? Always, God. I always try to mix in the 2014. Role, You're so. such a jerk for that. There's, there's my You're shot. such a jerk. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Appreciate it, man. Absolutely. Have a good one. Eric Kratz uh, with us here on GCR. Um, I, look, it's he lays that. What he's saying is compelling. Does it outweigh to me, again, the potential risk involved with this? And it's worth pointing out, it's not just that you're risking if he wins you know, Rookie of the Year this year, but like in three years, if he's third in MVP voting. You're missing out just by not having him on the opening day roster. The compelling argument for Eric Kratz is you you got to understand how important second base is and that there aren't enough reps. I understand exactly what he said. My immediate follow-up is, well, why wasn't this entrenched as the... It's not like it's surprising that you didn't have as much depth at second base as you had at shortstop. Was that worked out with Jackson Holiday's camp? Hey, we're not going to make the move to second base immediately. We want to get let you get your feet wet at the position you're comfortable at. I don't know. I don't know. But I, it's a compelling argument, and despite the fact that it's not how I feel, I have no problem discussing and debating you know, those arguments, and I appreciate the thought process from Eric Kratz. All right. Uh, today's show is also brought to you by ooh, this one's brought to you by Ruth's Chris. I always say whenever I say the words Ruth's Chris, I start to just hear the sizzle and smell that delicious steak. And whether you're celebrating a milestone or entertaining clients or just looking for like a great night out. 
Count on Roots Chris to deliver to you the finest steaks, the best service, and a level of hospitality that has made them one of the most revered names in steak since 1965. Make your reservation now at RootsChris.com. We will uh, go over the world of local high school sports when we come back in with Glenn Clark Radio. Just a real quick note, um, amongst the information that's come out from press conferences this morning, uh, the governor says that apparently uh, the crew of the container ship that, that struck the Key Bridge, um, you know, I, I think we've all seen they had power issues, and apparently they were able to issue a mayday call. And I, I don't know if anybody noticed, but there did, they did appear to be lesser traffic on the bridge at the time of impact. Apparently, it was just enough time for traffic to be put to a bit of a halt on the bridge. And so, as the governor said, uh, quote, these people are heroes. They saved lives last night. It does not limit the devastation and the, you know, the significance of the lives that were lost. But the thought of how much worse it could have been, that certainly does you know that there is um there is some feeling of um of hope because of that 
um, that this could have been uh, even worse than it was. So I um, appreciate that information being shared this morning by Governor Wes Moore as we continue to learn more about the tragic events of um, the early morning at the uh, Key Bridge. We are talking sports today because that's what we do here on GCR. I, I'm just not, believe it or not, I don't, I don't know enough about the topic to be able to give you much more information. Um, that's what I do here. A lot of people would say I don't really know enough about sports to be able to do this. So if I only barely know enough about that, I certainly don't know enough about anything else. On Tuesdays here on uh, GCR, we like to dive into the world of local high school sports. Of course, we have a great partner. It's called County Sports Zone, countysports.zone, which is proudly brought to you by your local Toyota dealer and buyatoyota.com. And our friend Wes Brown from County Sports Zone helps us out in uh, getting us uh, information and letting us know what's going on in the world of local high school sports. Wes Brown, good morning, my friend. How are you? Good, how are you? Everything is well, for the most part. Obviously, everybody here in this area, uh, our hearts continue to be with everyone impacted by the tragedy. But appreciate you taking the time for us. Um, Wes, so last week, obviously, we were recapping basketball championships. This week, we begin to shift our focus towards spring sports. So why don't we start on the lacrosse side and just maybe give me some some takeaways in the early portion of lacrosse season. Maybe we begin on the boys' side. Yeah, yeah. So obviously, you know, public school started last Thursday, but MI I am lacrosse has, has sort of been going on here for the the, the month of March. Um, a lot of the same schools have, have been standing out. You know, they're starting to play some conference games, mostly been playing, you know, some out of conference opponents, tournament opponents and things like that. Um, but it, it is a lot of familiar faces up at the top, um, especially on the boys' side. We've got uh, boys Latin at four and oh, Severn at um, four and two. Uh, St. John's Catholic Prep down in the the, the C conference is four and zero, um, and then St. Paul's is budding there at three and one. So um, a lot of familiar faces up there at the at the top of the MIA lacrosse standings. But uh, it'll be interesting to see how things go here with with conference play popping up. I, it's so funny, right? Like I so I was down in College Park yesterday working um, for Spalding as they were playing a game at the at CQ Stadium. And I looked down at the schedule, and I'm like, holy crap. They, they play boys Latin next Tuesday. Like, my God. We're, we're already there. They're already in the conference play. It's crazy how quickly that happens. And as you point out, boys Latin off to a great start. Uh, on the girls' side, what are some of the big stories? Yeah, so you, you know, you, you mentioned Spalding there on the, the yeah. boys' side, but on the girls' side, they've entirely played conference games, and they are 4-0 starting. So it's probably the one of the best starts you can get to a season there. Um, starting off 4-0 all-conference. Uh, but you also do have St. Paul's again on the girls' side, 5-1, and St. Mary's 5-0, and uh, Maryvale at 4-1, and, and then you got, obviously, you know, McDonough's always great, and they're, they're, they're kind of budding up there. So it should be a pretty pretty competitive season there on the, the girls' side in the A-conference, too. All right. Um, not just lacrosse, obviously, as we move into the spring. Our Athlete of the Week comes to us from the Diamonds. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Mardella Sr., uh, Colby Colwell, um, you know, last night actually threw a, a no hitter and a twelve nothing win over over Kent County. Pretty so impressive. Um, you know, public public school balls just started, um, and, and a lot of players are already making their impacts. Um, that that team's now won. You know, Mardella's won. You know, twenty eight zero combined over the last two games. So um, definitely a team to to watch there um, as they as they march towards the the playoffs. But getting a getting an amazing start. You know, kind of kind of yeah. unspeakable being able to just start the season off like yeah, that. Yeah, and no doubt for Colby Caldwell, something that uh, he'll remember probably for the rest of his life. So very remarkable. All right, let's uh, the the rundown of uh, what's ahead, what's available, what everybody can find right now at County Sports Zone. Yeah, so, you know, all the spring sports are underway. Um, you know, so there's there some spring break pauses kind of in some league. I think the, you know, Baltimore City, um, you know, some some other leagues are, are not playing this week. Um, and then some will be next week, some are last week. So, you know, kind of kind of a little bit light on schedules, but, you know, County Sports Zone has all the schedules and scores um, and, and content around, you know, high school sports in the state of Maryland. Um, we've got CSC baseball pick them. That'll be coming soon. Um, so be able to pick your winners there. And then we'll have, you know, lacrosse eventually coming after that. So a um, ton, ton of exciting stuff and, and, and the best way to connect with some some high school sports here. Uh, of course, you are on social media and CSC is on social media where? Yep. So at CSC scores on uh, Twitter and Instagram, you know, County Sports Zone on Facebook and County Sports dot zone. And then I'm at W underscore Brown 21. Wes Brown, always appreciate you, man. Thanks for spending a couple of minutes with us. We'll talk to you next Tuesday. All right. All right. Sounds good.
West Brown County Sports Zone Radio here on GCR. If you're craving that classic New York deli experience, then look no further than the new Atman's Deli in Baltimore's Harbor Point. Corned beef piled high, hand-rolled bagels, and they've got something different. They have a bar. At Atman's Harbor Point, go to atmansdeli.com for daily specials. So approval did come in this morning for the new kickoff rule in the NFL. Um, It was not voted upon yesterday. Looked like there was a little bit of momentum and they were trying to convert some of the holdouts and they were able to do that because it ended up being approved by the narrow margin of 29 to 3. Just just under the wire. Um, it, it's still difficult for me to fully explain. I understand that like if you watch the XFL, first of all, do you need help? Like, I mean, maybe you had a, a friend involved, so maybe that's the reason why you watch. Um I would like f- football. That's fair, right? But why would you? So why would you watch the XFL? Because they, they got football players. But they they're might have football. football players. They're playing football. They're they're doing something. I don't know what it is. Football, doing I something. Eh. Are you telling me I'm getting falsely eh. advertised to? So maybe I have a eh. I have a case here. Eh. Um, the it's gonna be weird, and I would almost I would have said it's too radical for me to be fully on board with it i look clearly there was momentum and they were clearly able to get the teams on their side but i would have said like yeah dude uh, 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 it's too much now in fairness i felt that way about rules changes in other sports and then i saw them in action and i said oh this is great so this will take some adjusting to. I also don't think I like the idea of there being a different. I, I don't foundationally. We like watching football on Saturday and we like watching football on Sunday. And I like for the sport to be the same. I don't like it when there's differences in the sport. So that that that'll be weird too. The way it's going to work is only the kicker will be on the opposite side of the field. He'll just be standing there by himself. Justin Tucker is going to be the lo- the lonesome kicker, as Adam Sandler once sung about years ago. When I think he was still funny then, I can't remember. What do you mean still? I don't remember if he was still funny when he did the Lonesome. I think he was still funny when the Lonesome Kicker came out. Pretty sure he's always. No, definitely not the case. Pretty sure he's always been funny. Well, he, wa- he used to be very funny, or I just used to be young. I've said that before. I'll never go back and rewatch. I don't want to know. Last I checked, like New, newfound glory over funny. here. No, the, you got, you got problems. I I will never. I will never go back and rewatch Billy Madison. That will never happen because I don't want to know if 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 it was if I was wrong. I just want to be able to have those memories, and for it to mean something to me for the rest of my life, and never have to 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 deal with that. So, your boy will never again in his life watch Billy Madison or Happy Gilmore or I'm trying to think of the other the Wedding Singer. I did still enjoy at that point. Like I will never go back and rewatch those films. I just leave the memories alone. I want them to be what they were, and I don't want to have to deal with it if I watch it now and say, "Oh God." Big Daddy. Uh yeah, of course, Big Daddy. Big oh, Daddy, absolutely, Big Daddy. Okay. Uh, absolutely on that list. It, it all turned. Little Nicky was when it turned. Like grown ups. Yeah. And no, like, those those stunk. Little Nicky was right unwatchable. Like maybe the worst film I've ever seen in a movie theater. Um, I gotta think about like how it compares. The first Lord of the Rings was really bad. That was awful. Awful. It was awful. It was three hours of them walking around. Just uh, yeah. I know they will make a movie. It's three hours. They're just gonna walk. And then at the end, uh, yeah, this, but. the the little guy will say to his fat buddy, "Hey, glad you're along for the ride, pal." And that's the end of the movie. And like, yeah, I don't have. I, I stood up and I'm like, what? And I had no interest. I didn't read the books. I, my my, we were home from college, and I went with my like childhood best friend and his family, and they were all like talking about it, and, like excited about the next one. I'm like, what? Did I watch something different than the rest of you? They were walking around for three hours. Three hours. They just walked, and then it was, hey pal, glad you're here with me. I've never stopped thinking about it. Never watched another one. Never will. Ever. It's the most infuriated ever been going to a movie theater. But Little Nicky was maybe the worst that I've ever seen. Wow. And I still went back. I think I watched Click in a movie theater. And then I wasn't mad at him 
I was mad at me. He said, I knew better. I knew better. Yeah, Click wasn't great. It was awful. <laughs> God, it was hey, terrible. Well, but I sure as hell didn't go see the what was the. No, we're talking about baseball. You step up to the plate. You're not going to yeah. hit a home run every time. Well, Come they on. stopped hitting singles some time ago. No. They stopped making there contact. There were extra base hits even last year. No. But you was so not invited to my bat mitzvah. That was a. That was a but was he that in was, that, that or was he just producing? Yeah, he was, yes, he was in. He was, uh, the, he was I, the I father of the. I don't girl. think I'd be willing His to daughter. watch it, but I do know that people said that, that it was not awful, so maybe I'd consider I watching it. it. Like literally, in the last fifteen years, there's been uncut gems and the end of list. Like end yeah, another, of list. Uh, like serious one. That and people seem to like that basketball one. Oh, uh, that was okay. Yeah. Yeah, I never. I had no interest. On none. Zero. No. Oh, Space Man. That's right. That's just. That's the one that just what? came out. This is the one with uh, Paul Dano as the big spider. I'm good. All right. I'm good. We talked I'm about good. this. Right. Sure, we did. Good. Anyway, I don't know how we got here. I don't know what just happened here. Yeah, I was talking about the kickoffs. Sandler. Kickoffs. Lonesome kicker. Justin Tucker is gonna be the lonesome kicker. Kicking for you. Um. Will he be singing? I don't think so. I mean, <laughs> although <laughs> it's Justin Tucker. Good point. He'll be the only one standing on the opposite side of the field. Everybody else will be lined up on the other side of the field, and they won't be able to move until the ball is fielded, which I, I guess is their way of doing away with like the big collisions where somebody has like a huge head full of steam. Um, some of these wedges, things that have been set up, those will be done away with. There's also a landing zone involved. So now, obviously, surprise extra kicks will be gone. But if you put the ball on the landing zone, your team can go get it if the other team doesn't field it. So there's going to be a lot of complications to this, and it's going to take us some time to adjust to it. And we've got it. Th those of us that, like, have grown out of the, the, the thing where it's cool to, like, somebody's going to – the broadcaster's going to get things wrong. They're going to study the rules, and they're still going to get things wrong. I'm still – and I haven't done many women's lacrosse games this year, but I'm still not fully – like when a green card becomes a yellow card and how many, like there's a new rule that came into play this year and I'm not doing enough women's lacrosse games. So when I do one, all of a sudden the second quarter, I remember like, oh crap, that rule. I didn't, crap. Like I have that feeling where I've forgotten what the rule was and when it comes into play. And th this is going to happen. Even guys doing NFL games, it's a new rule. All of the intricacies of it, it's going to be difficult. It's going to require a lot of help from the parties involved. But the new kickoff rule will come to football this year. We mentioned yesterday the um, the challenge system. Now you only have to win one challenge in order to be granted a third challenge. Um, I saw that clubs with an provides clubs with an unlimited number of designated to return transactions in the postseason. So I guess that means that anybody put on IR in the I don't I have no idea how that again. Or approved bylaws number two by Detroit amends article seventeen section seventeen dot sixteen of the Constitution and bylaws to provide clubs with an unlimited number of designated for return transactions in the postseason. So designated return is related to IR I guess that means that once you get to the postseason, you can bring back anybody who was put on IR. I'm not. I'm not. I gotta be honest. I don't. Fine. Because like once, like once you get to the postseason, you would have to have played in the first week, and had somebody get hurt, in order for there to be a chance for them to return before the postseason is over. Like four weeks, that would get you to the Super. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, man. I I don't know. Well, you can't. I, if you got to be out for four weeks, you can't get hurt in the postseason and still return. So the four week rule still applies. So it's not like you can like manipulate by putting someone on IR I, week seventeen or eighteen and then. Still I don't know. I would. I, I got to be honest around. with you. Somebody's got to explain that one to me. Uh, they're going to move the trading deadline to the Tuesday after week nine. So it's week eight before. I believe that's the case. So one more week to hopefully get a few more trades. Yes. Um. Approved to permit each club to place a maximum of two players who are placed on an applicable reserve list on the business day of the final roster deduction to be designated for return. What? Six players on the other team's list. 
Bro, I got to be honest. I'm going to need I'm going to we're going to need a smarter guy than me to read through this and explain it all to me. Is this the Rappaport tweet that you're that you're uh, reading over? Um no, what I'm looking at this? I I was emailed the right, actual emailed, okay. like rules changes. What rule is this? This is number 6. Approved bylaws number 6 by the competition committee amends article 17 section I, 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 my head hurts. All right, I, well I just pull out the book. I need somebody to dumb it down for me. Talk to me like I'm five. What does this impact? How does this impact me? On the business day. So this is a training camp thing? All right, number s- uh, here are some gameplay ones that matter. I think I, think I can handle these better. <laughs> I think. Um, to include a ruling of passer down by contact or out of bounds before throwing a pass is a reviewable play. Okay, so those are things that you'll now be able to review. Did someone throw the ball? I don't know why you weren't able to review those things before. That seems odd. Why was that the case? But you'll be able to review that now. Uh, allow a replay review when there's clear and obvious visual evidence that the game clock expired before any snap. Oh, that's a big one. That's a biggie. Because we've always just been told, hey, that's got to fall into gray area because the official has, you know, like it just because you see zero on the clock doesn't mean it's a penalty because the official has to notify it. That'll be really interesting because how many times have we seen like a big play during the course of a game and then somebody went back and looked and, well, the play clock seems to have said zero before the ball was snapped. So now there's a big game changing play. You tell the booth, hey, make sure that the snap got off in time. We have to add, uh, like, in basketball, like, we have to add tenths of a second to the game I, clock. I don't know. I don't know how that's going to work. That's really interesting that they're adding that. Um, we we know they got rid of the hip drop tackles yesterday. Sounds like more reviews. And the yeah, the new kick. Um, so that's those are the rules changes for this year. Uh, permanent injury reporting. Uh, it, a resolution by Buffalo to make injury reporting rules for players who do not travel with their clubs to games away from their home city competitively fairer. What? What does that mean? If they're not there, why does it matter to you what, what the story is? They're not there. That's very weird. And then, all right, whatever. I think that's all that matters. I think that's all that matters as far as the rules are concerned. The, the kickoff one's going to be one that we're going to need a lot more. We're going to need to see. By the way, if they're doing it in that, whatever, the, what's the name of the stupid league now? The UFL, is that what it's called? The, the yes, combined yeah, the yeah, USFL the UFL and the XFL? Are they doing that still in that league? I don't know. I, I have to pull out the rule book for that I, one. I had absolutely zero interest Probably. in ever watching a UFL game, but now you might be able to get me to tune in to see just the. They did it for the XFL. Can somebody alert me when a kickoff is about to happen in this thing so I can flip over, watch it, and then stop watching it immediately afterwards? I would appreciate that. That That's something that I ask for help with. All right, those are the rules changes uh, approved by the NFL this year. I, that's all I got for you. I'm still I'm still confused by it. Um, oh, J- uh, Proctor suggested that we should have to dress and speak like little Nikki for a whole show as a side bet. Bet. Um, I'm good. Right, I'm so good. I'm good. I'll Little pass. Nikki. You don't remember Little Nikki? It was awful. God, g- good for you. Don't don't look it up. Your life is so much better not knowing what Little Nikki was. Oh, yeah, it was, it was a little awful. dog. Awful. There's a little dog on the thing. Awful, awful film. I mean, Adam Sandler horrifying is film. Little Nikki. Um, from what's the what? What's the premise? He's like. I, I, it, his it involves the devil. Is the like, son of is the, the son dog of that played Mr. Beef. Like it, dude. It's so. Like it's an acid trip kind of movie, but I don't even think it would be good if you were on acid. But Patricia Arquette's in it. Great. So there's that. Um, from John Lovitz. From Tarantino's in it. What's that? Tarantino is in it. Qu- Quentin Tarantino is in the movie. Right. I don't know why you're still telling me things about Little Nicky. I've told you it's the worst film just ever interested. made. Don't be. It's an abomination. Maybe if you go into it like wanting to see an abomination, you'll feel something about it. I'm not sure. Um, I, a lot of people have been mad at me because I've talked about Ramona Rios being a blow. 
Dude, don't you remember that Ramon Arias won a gold glove? Bro, I I love y'all. Love y'all. You're wonderful people, I guess. I don't know how to tell you this. I You can't argue with the data. You don't have to like it, but you can't make something something that you want it to be. We have data from last year. Ramon Arias was a poor defensive player. Not disappointing based on gold glove standards. Awful. I have not been able to find. Do, do you know? I don't. I'm still new with baseball savant. Do you know how to access the data on baseball savant from the previous year? Uh, uh, do you know how to do that? Probably. I don't know. I I I've been trying to figure out. And there was a ba- there was a little Nicky video game play. Oh, that's that's wonderful. Okay, I might be able to do this. So hang on. Okay, I think I'm going to be able to do this. Ramon Arias in 2022. I you they have a weird like I don't know how to describe it. They can go back, you can you can watch as the numbers change year to year. I don't know why you can't just change the year, but you can like watch a video. Oh, you can. All right, I never never mind. Sorry. You got it. Glenn Clark, I got it. Okay, good. 2022 for Ramon Arias. Absolutely outstanding. According to um, Baseball Savant, which, again, is Major League Baseball's accepted way of measuring defensive metrics and advanced statistics. In 2022, Ramon Arias was in the 90th percentile. 90th percentile in terms of his range defensively. Ergo... Wins the gold glove. Gains the reputation of being an outstanding defender. So much so that I talk about how I'm in love with him at all times. Last year. <laughs> I mean, this is staggering. Last year, from the 90th percentile in defensive range to the third from 90 to third, which is extraordinarily porous. Arm strength was in the 19th percentile a year ago. In 2022, his arm strength was in the 20th. It was never, apparently, it was never a particularly strong arm. But the range in 2022 was outstanding. A year ago, it was awful. Is it possible that for health reasons, how many games did he play in 2021? How many games? I feel like he played fewer games. I don't know. Maybe he, he didn't play the whole season in 2021. Eh, he had 296 plate appearances, so he played a lot. He was The year that stands out is 2022. He played 85 in 2021. 85. They played. 2022 is the only year of his career where he appears to have been a good defender. Now, but he was really good. He was really good. He was really good. It's a very fair point, Griffin. I'm not even making fun of you. He was really good in 2022 and gained a reputation for being an outstanding defensive player. I I don't know what to make of that. It is the outlier in Ramona Rios's career. I love the way Ramon Arias plays the game. I love his effort. I love his willingness to lay out. But I can't, because I like that, pretend like the numbers tell me something that they don't. The numbers say it's not just that he's not a good defensive player. The numbers say he's a bad defensive player. So what do I do with that? What what do I do with that? I get it. You guys keep wanting to to, to talk about Ramon Arias won a gold glove. It's Isn't almost there? like a, 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 a football tight end that you just want to keep talking about how he used to play basketball. Dude, you did, did you know that Jimmy Graham used to play basketball? Like, I, 
we just keep saying it over and over and over again. Like, I I understand he won a gold glove. I was in love with Mo- Ramon Arias. I don't know what to make of this. I don't know whether I can say definitively that he'll never be a good defensive third baseman ever again. But what I can't do is assume he's a good defensive player because, again, ever, the most recent thing I have is the opposite of that. Literally the opposite. Not just that he took a step backwards. Like, it was dreadful. Could there be something to they feel like Maybe it's not the right word, but like they feel like they almost owe it to him to like you know keep him around. Yeah, I, that does nothing for like, people. Keep bringing been that here up since twenty twenty. Well, there's a there's a couple things there, right? Like a, a lot of people say, well, if in order to have Holiday on the team, you would have had to have gotten rid of Arias. Well, that's also not true. It looks like Tyler Nevin's going to be on the team. Now, somebody I think Steve Molesky pointed out yesterday that Tyler Nevin has pretty good numbers against lefties, and if they are preparing, and, and it's it's weird to me how they can know already that, like, they're going to face so many lefties. But if they are preparing to face a lot of lefties, then, uh, okay, I mean, I, I sort of hear you. Sort of. I sort of get it. But I would start with you don't have to get rid of Ramon Arias in order to have had room for Jackson Holiday. As it turns out, like, a lot of us thought Colton Wong was going to get that spot. He didn't. There is a spot still to be had. I don't even think they've officially said that Tyler Nevin's on the team yet. No, they haven't. Which suggests that maybe they're still looking for something as to far as outside help is concerned. But Tyler Nevin right now would be in line to be on the roster on opening day if they don't acquire anyone from outside the organization. Um. I'm not opposed to the the outside-the-box thinking, hey, we think we're going to face more lefties to start the season, so let's have one more guy on the roster for the first month who's good against lefties. We're not committed to him beyond that. We're not telling you that Tyler Nevin's going to be part of this thing until July, but we just think for the first month of the season, we'd be better off having somebody that hits lefties well. Interesting thought, right? Like, interesting. defensible now I do better hit lefties right (laughs) like that better prove to be the it better work out exactly the way that you think it's going to um but what I can't do I I can't make Ramona Rhea something he isn't because we want him to be or because we like him I like him a lot but I have to talk within the realm of reality the reality is a year ago he was a bad 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 defensive player and for more of his career, he's been a bad defensive player than he's been the gold glover. Even though he still looks like, you know, he's given that type of effort. I just can't. We get caught in this constantly, and I get a lot of messages about this. I, I guess they're, they're thinking if there's anything left, like like some semblance of being a gold glove utility infielder. They don't want to. I don't know that. Stan, but I don't says, think there's you know, any get, getting rid of for getting rid of these these guys for nothing. They don't want to do that. And yeah, and I know that we talk about that constantly. And at some point, I would say that's what they're worth. Like, I, and I mean that with due due respect. If you can't get anything for them, what does that say about them? I, I'm always inclined to try to get something if you can. But if you can't, how much are they helping your team? Which isn't to say, again, I get it. Like, Ryan O'Hearn was available for nothing, right? Like, the helpful pieces can be found. The fact that you can't trade somebody doesn't mean they're worthless. It's just that every other team thinks they have their own version of this guy. So we don't need yours. We've got that guy in our organization. It, it it's unfair to call them worthless, but I don't think Ramon Arias. I I have no concern personally, and I like Ramon Arias. About if you had to let go of Ramon Arias, I I think he is a bit player in a championship picture. I think there can be another Ramon Arias that comes around. You probably have another Ramon Arias. I like the guy. I like his effort. He's had a lot of big hits. But 
I can't pretend like he's a difference maker. And so I just don't think that way. That thought process doesn't doesn't register with me that like well you better try to get something for him. Why? It's okay. It's okay. If you think you have really good baseball players, it's okay if you lose this one. Who was the guy that we were all panicked about losing last year because of his spring? Uh, Played Fran- for the Yankees? Yeah, Cordero. Franchi Cordero. Franchi Cordero. Yeah. Franchi Cordero. We're all worked up about. Yeah, like, a couple homers for the Yankees. God. And well, he hit one on opening day, right? Yeah. Like, and we're like, ah, oh, this what is killer. Done? And then, like, within three weeks, we realized this guy was a nothing. And I'm not saying that Ramona Rios is Franchi Cordero. I don't, I don't want to – I feel like I'm being terribly disrespectful to Ramona Rios. If you guys listen to this show, you know I love Ramona Rios. Like, I love him. You just called him nothing. Shut up. Worthless. Sh- that's not Those what were your I said. Exact words. No, they were not my exact words. <laughs> um, I just can't get in that world where I I have romantic feelings about. I can't have romantic feelings about players that I think are better than Ramona Rios. Because either you're going to be a part of it or you're not. Now, I'm not suggesting they just let like Austin Hayes go. I'm not suggesting they just release him. But like I just don't I can't get into the romantic feelings about somebody that I don't think is a cornerstone part of what it is this team is trying to do. And admittedly, I've made the mistake of falling it. We we had, over the last couple of years of this show, we had we did segments about whether or not Jorge Mateo might be a cornerstone piece of the team. We did segments about whether or not Austin Hayes was was Nick Markakis for this franchise. Might be. Eh. It's a reach. I'm not trying to diminish Austin Hayes either. Love Austin Hayes. I really do. Worthless, you're exactly. Shut up. (laughs) Love Austin Hayes. i got to watch what it is that I'm saying (laughs) because people hear what they want to hear when we have these conversations. Um, I I just don't know that ultimately they're cornerstone pieces. I don't know. I certainly don't think that Ramon Arias is. I think he's... Still more of a tourist than he is a. What could be the worst case scenario. I'm trying, like, I'm trying to think. It, like, if he were to have an uh, Jorge Mateo April, you know, oh, from right, last year, right. and then Rios is here all year, right? Um, no, no, I, I don't, I, I know what you're saying, but like, I, I think people are really unfair about Mateo anymore. Like, I think that because of what Mateo isn't, you're unwilling to look at what he is. And right. the skill set that he does have, if yeah. used, he's clearly not an everyday player. So it'd, po- it'd be impossible for that to be like the same thing. Correct. Like, I can't measure. It, he, he's not. He's never going to be a late inning defensive replacement pinch runner, right? Like it's just not the way that you're going to use Jorge Mateo. And remember, like the biggest hit of all last season, we see Jorge Mateo flying around the bases in that game against Tampa. Like it, that, there is value in that. And he does hit lefties, no matter how much we want to ignore it. So that the what the value that he brings, I'm not sure yet exactly what role Ramon Arias fills if he's not an everyday player. To say he's versatile, I guess. I don't think he's particularly strong. Again, he's not a what we saw last year, he's not a good defensive third baseman. We just remember him winning a gold glove the year before, and so we think of him that way. So have a lot to do on the program today. Uh, Patrick Stevens is going to join us. We'll talk about the uh, NCAA tournament. Maybe he can tell us a little bit more about Rodney Rice. Gonna, by the way, did you see this guy from Harvard that's in the portal now? What's his name? Malik. Mark Malik. And Jeff Ehrman tweeted about it this morning. And I, I was like, what? Uh, Malik, Malik Mack. Mack. <laughs> Malik Mack was a freshman at Harvard. I don't know what his numbers were a year ago. Um... Jeff Ehrman from Inside MD Sports says he'll be in high demand. What the heck? Shares a picture (laughs) of Malik Mack (laughs) being celebrated by the Ivy League for having won Rookie of the Week at one point. And on his left wrist, he has the University of Maryland logo tattooed. It's like the older logo, too. Yes, it's an old logo. Like the logo for when they won the national championship. Um... Apparently averaged 17 points and uh, 4.8 assists per game. He is uh, an Oxen Hill native. So, right, so D- yeah, D.C., you know, uh, obviously DMV kid, from went to St. John's in D.C. You would think that he would have a lot of interest in coming to play basketball at Maryland. Is that the Boondocks kid? 
I don't, I'm not looking at the that's tattoo. That's the other tattoo. If you say so. I don't. I'm not. I'm not an expert on this topic. Um. Yeah, that's definitely. I think that's definitely a Boondocks tattoo. Okay. Well, that one's far less interesting. <laughs> oh, actually, I do recognize that kid yeah. because I've seen enough internet memes. Um, I've never watched the Boondocks in my life. Uh, I haven't um, watched much of it either. No, but, but I, yeah, that's definitely. No, that's, that's definitely what that kid is. Um, and he's got a Maryland tattoo on his wrist, which is just the wildest. Maybe he wants to come to Towson. That's probably. Yeah. That's <laughs> it's gotta be what it is. Yes. Yeah. It's dying to get to Towson. Um, so that's interesting. But we'll talk about Rodney Rice with uh, Patrick here in a minute and uh, go over the tournament. And then Maryland Cross may be in danger of missing the NCAA tournament altogether after they lost to Michigan on Saturday. They got some work to do to make sure they get in. So a lot to discuss with Patrick talk today. Talk about the biggest uh, local win as well. Uh, it's cr- the first win of the Chris Ryan that's era. Right. That's right. All they needed Mary. to do was get a new play-by-play guy. I guess so. And the winning starts coming. <laughs> Griffin was out at Mount St. Mary's for that one on Saturday. Today's show also brought to you by Sports and Social. That's where Griffin and I are going to be Thursday night. Watching round of 16 action, the regional semifinals get underway on Thursday night, and we will be inside Sports and Social at Live Casino in Hotel Maryland. Griffin will be trying to help you win some money. We'll have great giveaways. We'll have swag to give away during timeouts. Plus, we'll have some grand prizes, including a pair of baseball tickets. So you want to come hang out with us, Live Casino and Hotel, Sports and Social, Great food and drink specials throughout the course of the evening. Come hang Thursday night after the baseball game. When the baseball game ends, go report directly to Sports and Social to hang with us. The atmosphere is unlike anywhere else. It's just the coolest place to watch games. Everybody's into it. Everybody's living and dying by every shot because they all have action on the games. So they're all excited about it. Come hang out with us, Sports and Social, Thursday for the round of 16 after the baseball game at, um, at Live Casino and Hotel. Glenn Clark Radio.
All right, back in here on GCR as we continue along on a Tuesday edition of the program. Stan the Fan, Ross Grimsley, and Luke Jackson got together to do a more prolonged uh, baseball preview yesterday. If you missed that, find it Facebook.com slash PressBoxSports, YouTube.com slash PressBoxOnline, or PressBoxOnline.com slash video. Um, and you can check it all out there. Also, the print issue of PressBox is still available at your neighborhood Royal Farms, any of the hundreds of locations around town where you find PressBox. You can read it all at PressBoxOnline.com. It's a big deep dive into the 2024 Orioles and their hopes to take the next step forward, so you'll get the print issue today as we'll have a new one uh, hitting stands here in a couple of weeks. Obviously, um, our thoughts continue to be with everyone impacted by uh, the tragedy on the Key Bridge this morning. You know, we do sports here. We just w- I, we are not qualified to give you more information about it, but um, I don't want anyone to think that we are just being flip or dismissive of it. Uh, we know uh, how significant it is, and um, we continue to uh, hope for uh, miracles when it comes to recovery, but um, our hearts are very much with that. Just not our area of expertise whatsoever. So we continue to uh, talk sports here on GCR. We will do uh, our NFL draft segment before the end of the show. But right now, since it is Tuesday, let's talk a little bit about the start of the NCAA tournament and the world of college lacrosse for our college sports segment. Joining us, as he does every week, our friend Mr. Patrick Stevens from the Washington Post, USA Lacrosse Magazine, And on Twitter, at Discourse, D1S Course. Patrick, good morning, my friend. Thanks for taking the time, as always. And thanks for having me, Glenn. Um, I I don't know where. I'll start because of local relevance. Maryland lands a transfer in Rodney Rice from Virginia Tech. What are they getting in Rodney Rice? Uh, They're getting a guy that had a reputation as an an excellent scorer, basically, uh, going into Virginia Tech. probably didn't play as much as he really wanted to uh hence why he basically uh um left i think it was in october if i recall right yeah it sounds uh and so you know and so i think i think uh he kind of looks i i I know i read an interview with him where he basically said you know kevin willard allows his guards to kind of let loose um so you would think that, that he believes he's going to come in and, and try to be the next Jameer Young for all intents and purposes. I don't know if that's going to happen, uh, but it's certainly a backcourt piece, uh, one of many uh, that, that Maryland is, is going to need to have next season. So uh, a, a useful addition, but I, I, I'm hesitant to say that it's it's an answer to all of Maryland's problems at this point. No, I, I, I certainly understand that entirely, and they've got a lot more work to do, clearly, as they go into the portal. <laughs> Um, biggest takeaways from the first weekend of the tournament for you? Uh, I, I would say that it's that most of the teams that we thought were going to be good were good. Yeah. Um, you know, you look at it, and all the one seeds are through, all the two seeds are through, uh, every all the three seeds except Kentucky are through, and 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 so th- there wasn't a whole lot. Or I'm sorry, Kentucky and Baylor. Uh, so it's 10 of the top 12 teams that, that in terms of seeding, that, that made it through. And, and I thought Kentucky was a bit of a stretch as a three seed anyway. Uh, so, you know, you look at it, and there's only two teams seated below five that are still in the field, Clemson, which knocked off Baylor, uh, and then NC State, which continues to be the, the surprise team and, and was helped, obviously, a bit by the fact that they got to deal with Oakland. Not that it was easy to deal with Oakland, uh, but, uh, but I would say that, that it's, if you were looking for like the best teams to make it through, if you were sitting there when we have that conversation of yeah. how many teams can realistically win the tournament, well, you know, pretty much all of these teams that are that are through, other than maybe NC State and Clemson and maybe Gonzaga, uh, are all teams you would have listed in that group uh, a, a month, month and a half or so ago. What do so we? It, how do we talk about the NC ahead. State thing, Patrick? Right, like because I. It it really is difficult for me to find contact. I don't think they're outstanding. What they're doing is almost unprecedented. Like, I, how do we talk about? How do we give context to what NC State has done here? Well, it, it's not unprecedented if you think about 1983. Well, um, that's fair. Okay, fair. But, yeah. But yeah. Uh, but the, the the funny the funny thing is is this is the first time that NC State has started a seven game winning streak after January 1st of the season since 1984. <laughs> like they just, they, 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 
they just haven't had a run like this in 40 freaking years. Um, and that year was weird. Uh, it was the year after they won the national title. They won nine in a row and then immediately followed that by losing their last seven games. So <laughs> it was like a super streaky team that, that, that got bounced very, very quickly from the postseason. But for this team, it's it's interesting that one of the big things that's happened for them, like if you really get into it in granular detail, the, the guy that's made this work is actually Mohamed Diara. Uh, he's a guy that they started early in the season, a Missouri transfer, rebounding machine, and then he kind of faded from the rotation. Like, I mean, he was a guy that was suddenly getting like eight minutes a game, six minutes a game. Uh, and over the last, I'd say, four weeks or so, he's his, he's reestablished himself in a larger role starting. Uh, his rebounding was considerably valuable in that ACC tournament run. And and I think he's the guy that's kind of made this work, a four-man that can step outside, knock down a three on occasion. Uh, and so, you know, there's other guys that have kind of seen their roles expand and, and maybe contract a little bit. But that's the guy, I think, that, that has really provided them with a, a, a glass-crashing option to complement D.J. Burns. I mean, Diara playing the way he has has allowed Burns – to sort of do his thing, which is basically just be the most popular guy on the floor right, right. where he gets the ball at the free throw line and backs people down, which is which is truly delightful for oh. people that like just the basics of basketball. Yep. So that that's one of the, that's one of the big things that's happened for this NC State team. But I would tell you, I was, I was talking to somebody just an hour or so ago. Um, this is a team that was trailing Louisville. In the at halftime <laughs> of the first game of the ACC tournament, like the yeah. way they played in that in that game up until the last ten to twelve minutes was abysmal, and for them to have done all that and then you know basically got on the run they have and and they obviously played great against Texas Tech and played well enough against Oakland, uh, yeah. against Oakland um, is is rather remarkable given that this was this was a team we were talking about the, the you know Kevin Keats probably being in a position where they might fire him. Yep. As if, they had, if they had lost to Louisville and, and ended the season with what, like six straight losses or something like that, probably would be talking about a coaching search and rally. Instead, uh, he got an automatic extension for winning the ACC tournament, and they're sitting here in the Sweet 16 for the first time in nine years. Uh, it is it is a really, really r- amazing, amazing story. Um, are, are we Has Purdue done enough you know, in, in this last game for us to maybe like put some of the – is Purdue going to Purdue this thing to bed, or does that still need to be proven against better teams? Well, here's the thing. Like, Purdue could go and lose, like, a one-possession game to Gonzaga or, or Creighton or Tennessee this weekend, and that doesn't mean that Purdue went and purdued something. Yeah. Like, that, that, mean, that means they ran into teams that are pretty darn good, yeah. and they just got outplayed a little bit. Now, if they go, go and lose by 30 to one of these teams, sure. But I think the opportunity for them – to you know, truly have a regrettable loss. I mean, you think about all these double-digit seeds they've lost to. Well, there's only one of them left in the field. So it, if they play, if they play that one team, they would be in the Final Four. So <laughs> uh, you yeah. know, are we really going to sit here yeah. and, and, and glower at Purdue if it somehow loses a national semifinal to NC State? No, they made the Final Four. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. That's you. You've ex- you have answered the question perfectly. That is exactly the way that we're looking for. Um, as far as the coaching carousel is concerned, I, I would think that if you're uh, – how, how did it go so poorly for Michigan the last time and go so much better for Michigan this time around? Well, I mean, if I recall right, like part of the reason that, you know, it didn't go great for Michigan the last time was the timing of it all, right? Like John Beeline yeah, the best that's job true. with the Cavaliers later, right? right? Yeah, that and is so, right. You know, so – so they and and it feel you know it always had that feel of well Jawan Howard wants the job so you're a little boxed into giving it to the program legend and of course you get into danger zone there if I recall right Ed Cooley was the other name that was in the mix um, when uh, when that job opened so you know I, I think I think you know Dusty May probably had his choice of a number of jobs and, and if I were him I probably would have taken that one too uh, there's a little less pressure uh, and the resources are excellent. And it's one of those jobs that, that I feel like is a little bit like Florida and Texas and Ohio State, which is as long as you're winning 20 games and making the tournament every year, which is easier said than done. But as long as you're doing that, that's a place where they'll tend to leave you alone for a while. Uh, whereas at Louisville, you know, it, that, that's sort of a baseline expectation. 
And even then, you're probably going to get badgered a little bit for, well, why didn't you, you know, make the Sweet 16? Even though, given what Louisville has been through over the last seven or eight years, right. you wonder what the expectations realistically should be going forward for them. So, no idea. No idea. Just maybe, like, win 10 games. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, yeah. it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a real, the, the thing is, is that it is a fabulous basketball market. No and doubt. They are great no doubt. Fans. Yeah. And they, and while I, I don't have, I don't have a vested interest in whether Louisville is good or not. Right. I, I certainly, I certainly would say that people that are that invested in their team deserve better than the sorts, some of the performances that we saw over the last two seasons, where a team was just utterly uninterested in doing much of anything that was productive or responsible or anything. So I think, I, I think for Louisville, it, it will be curious who gets that job and, you know, how much patience there is because, you know, uh, fair or not, like there is sort of a baseline level of confidence that isn't unfair to ask of somebody. Like you can sit here sure. and say the Maryland fans are upset with, with what they saw, but there was a baseline level of confidence at, at beyond confidence right. at the defensive end that tells you, well, there is coaching going on. Uh, there were obviously, you know, roster building problems. But it wasn't as if somebody was completely out to lunch in terms of actually coaching the team that they had. And you wondered about that with Louisville sometimes. So I, I think that, that that's really obviously one of the, one of the big gigs that's, that's still floating around out there. Uh, should be curious to see exactly who they land and, and how long it takes to make them uh, competent. Because it, it, is, it is amazing how things have, have unraveled on them here over the last few years. They're DePaul. Like it's, it's at, at best, they're DePaul. Well, they lost to DePaul right, this year. Right, right. They're not. They're not. DePaul. They're not DePaul. I promise you, they're not. <laughs> All right, um, Patrick. Two things I wanted to touch on before we play the game. One, uh, I know how much you are a to the monitor guy. I, I know it's your favorite thing in the world. You love how much time is spent at the monitor late in games. Um, it's great for basketball. The conversation renewed after what happened at the end of the Kansas Sanford game and the Nick Timberlake thing. I, I, I it does feel like it's not good for the sport. For, for that to play out, but what what do they do, if anything, moving forward? And you can't do it with that play. I mean, that, like, if you're just going to do that, then you might as well just have, like, uh, robots calling the game, right? Like, I mean, like, you, there's, not a, there's not a way to overturn a foul like that. Uh, and if you want to sit there and say, well, that's an obvious miss, well, it's an obvious miss depending on where your perspective is. Um, you know, I think part of the problem with that call was it was – probably not the best angle um, yeah. on the play, not being able to see the back, the back yeah. end of the play. So, you know, all, you already have, you already have these games dragged out long enough as they are. I, I think you just have to accept that there's a certain degree of human error that's going to be involved. And, and you know what, there, there was, you know, there were consequences to that because I think Lamar Simpson was probably going to end up uh, working a second round game. And he didn't, I mean, that's huh. a guy that, that huh. worked a worked a regional last year. He didn't get a regional assignment. So, you know, that's a, that's a significant thing. That is, that is, I did not know that, and that is noteworthy. Uh, our friend Pete Medhurst did a nice video breakdown as uh, Pete uh, manages officials and explained why it is that the, uh, the angle was so bad, and I appreciated watching that. Um, on the lacrosse front, uh, are we at a point where we ought to start talking about whether or not there's danger for Maryland even making the NCAA tournament? Yeah, that's not unreasonable at this point. Um, I think they're right at the edge of the field, and that victory at Syracuse, um, in overtime back in February looks more and more valuable by the week. Uh, but they, there's certainly some work to do for Maryland. And, uh, you know, there will be even more work to do if they can't go to Penn State and be one of the best teams in the country on the road. I mean, that's a great opportunity coming up for them. Uh, and if they, you know, if they don't get that one, then the pressure is really going to be on when they play Ohio State and Rutgers at home uh, over the following two weeks. Uh, plus, you know, that probably two losses in the league pretty much – it doesn't guarantee you having to play in the quarterfinals on the, instead of having an off weekend, but it makes it a lot more likely. So I, I think if you're if you're Maryland, uh, there's uh, there's some wiggle room that's already been lost. Yeah, it is it is crazy to think. Do, I, I don't know what is. Do we know off the top? Do you know off the top of your head what the streak is for Maryland? Uh, the last time they missed was 2002. They're the only okay. team that has made it in every year um, of the 16 team field. That's remarkable. That is crazy. All right, let's play our game. Can Patrick Stevens name the MLB teams this particular player has played for or managed? Um, and I'll begin. Again, we got to go a little bit ways back. This is, of course, uh, Pedro Martinez's all-time favorite baseball person. 
Four teams for Don Zimmer in his managerial career. Of course, it seemed like he was a bench coach for seemingly every team in baseball at some point. Yes. Uh, Don Zimmer's managerial career included stops in Boston. Yes. In San Diego. Correct. That's where it started. That's where it started. He was definitely with the Cubs. Of course. And there is an 81-82 stint. An 81-82 stint for Don Zimmer. Okay. Um, let me think through this one because that one's, that one's a little trickier. Um, where I, was Don I Zimmer? I did not remember this for what it's worth. I did not remember it. Okay. Well, I, I got I to gotta sit here and sort of process this one because this is a little – this is one that I don't remember either, quite frankly. Um, although it does – it does mean that I can eliminate four teams from That's my true. consideration. That's true. They were not around. They definitely that were. That, that were. I know it. I know, I know who it wasn't. Right. Um, so we're down to one in twenty-five because uh, you got the three you already got and four teams that didn't exist. So it's a one in okay four percent chance one, of getting this. All right. Uh, Don Zimmer's other was he in? He was at the Rangers. Right? That's exactly right. Well done, Don Zimmer. Four for four. Very nicely done. All right, um, someone, a five-team guy. Actually, it's a, uh, a six-team guy, uh, still active, two-time All-Star, and a two-time World Series champion, Nathan Eovaldi, next up on the list. Oh, Christ. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Man, you know, we, we're being, it's been a rough day. <laughs> Well, I mean, this is I, I, I'm not I'm not in my routine spot to be able to sit down and really, oh, and really like think scribble of, things think down. And what. I, not, I got it. It's not helping either. But he he was in he was in Tampa, right? Sure was, of course. Although okay. I did he, not realize I I associate him with Tampa as well. It was his shortest stint of his career. Really? Okay. Yes. Uh, well, he was in Boston, right? For sure, from uh, eighteen to twenty-two. Okay. Um, Minnesota, maybe. Not Minnesota, no. I feel like that might okay. be where where he and Jake Odorizzi end up uh, crossing. There's uh, who we did last week. Okay. Um. Oh gosh, I don't know. All um. Right. Tex Texas, Houston, the Cubs. And so off we go. so Texas is where he is currently and won the World Series last year. Um. But yeah, uh, the, I I I would have told you you should have gone with your gut on some of these. There's a Dodgers and a Yankees in there, both okay. for Nathan Eovaldi and a Marlins. You want to do Demetri Young, or you want to bag it till next nope. week? Nope. All right, we'll bag it till next week. Patrick, where are you going to be this week? Uh, still figuring that one out. Okay, at Discourse, D1S Course on Twitter. Always appreciate you, sir. We'll talk next Tuesday, all right? Oh, Patrick had to go. I think he had an event uh, that he was at today, so I apologize uh, to Patrick. I didn't realize that we were running up on it time-wise. All right. Um, appreciate him taking the time for us as always. Can we grab a break? Because I think we have to make one up now. We had a, a, apparently had a com commercial issue. We'll try to get that fixed. Uh, but when we come back in, we'll do our NFL draft segment. Ben Standing from The Athletic. That's next. It's Glenn Clark Radio. Craving that classic New York deli experience? Look no further than the new Atman's Deli in Baltimore's Harbor Point. Corned beef piled high, hand-rolled bagels, and something different. A bar! Atman's has food and drink specials every day. Now open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Dine in, grab takeout, or hang out at the bar for the next O's game. Atman's Deli, an authentic taste of Baltimore tradition since 1915. Find us at Harbor Point or visit atmansdeli.com. Why bet with the big boys this football season? Instead, try your hand with the local book, Superbook Sports, this fall. Superbook Sports is the book next door. Just a dedicated team of the best odds makers in Las Vegas, making sure you get the best prices and parlays anywhere. And now, Superbook will give you a bonus of up to $250 when you sign up and wager on the same day and use the promo code GLENNCLARK23, G-L-E-N-N-C-L-A-R-K-2-3. So bet with the best. And use the promo code GlennClark23 this football season with Superbook Sports. Visit Superbook.com for terms and conditions. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler. Whether you're celebrating a special milestone, entertaining clients, or simply enjoying a night out, count on Ruth's Chris to deliver you the finest steaks, the best service, and a level of hospitality that has made Ruth's Chris one of the most revered names in steaks since 1965. Make your reservation now at Ruth's Chris. Dot com. 
Whether your focus is luxury and comfort, convenience and technologically advanced connectivity, or sporty performance and aggressive styling, we've got the perfect Highlander for you. Check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new Highlanders from your local Toyota dealer today. The ultimate fan experience awaits you at Sports and Social Maryland. See how we're raising the sports bar with our massive 100-foot media wall featuring 40 HD TVs and a 47-foot big screen. Bet on your favorite teams and this year's biggest events at the FanDuel Sportsbook while enjoying your favorite beers and cocktails, plus our delicious takes on bar food classics. Visit Sports and Social at Live Casino in Hotel Maryland. At Arundel Mills, must be 21. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Discover one of Baltimore's hidden gems at Guilford Hall Brewery. Enjoy dinner in our spacious brew pub. Sip a signature cocktail in our outdoor dog-friendly beer garden. Or take a tour of our brewery. Discover your new favorite local craft beer. From crisp lagers to hoppy ales, there's something for everyone to enjoy. Pair your brew with delicious appetizers and entrees. There are options for the whole family, but you have to try our fan favorite giant pretzel. Guilford Hall Brewery, where every sip is a celebration. Visit us online at guilfordhall.com. The latest edition of Press Box is available now, and on the cover we look at the promise of spring for the Baltimore Orioles as Todd Karpovich and others shine the light on the team's hopes to take the next step towards championship contention and what reinforcements could still be coming. Plus, Press Box personalities offer suggestions to David Rubenstein about stewarding the franchise. Also inside, Bo Smolko on how the Ravens' defense could evolve with new coordinator Zach Orr. And we meet lacrosse players from the men's and women's programs across the state. Press Box is available for free at over 500 area locations, including 60 Royal Farm stores. And you can always find the entire edition, as well as the best daily coverage of the O's, Ravens, and Terps at PressBoxOnline.com. Contrary to what some people believe, I actually like this guy when he sleeps. Glenn Clark, talking sports. All right, back in here on GCR as we continue along on a Tuesday edition of the program. Today's show is also brought to you by Goose Flights, which is a partnership of Press Box and Guilford Hall Brewery and available all over town. Goose Flights Lager is delicious, and on top of it just being a really tasty beer, it's also going to help the community as 198 from every can sold goes to benefit the Goose Flights Foundation and the work they do to provide non-emergency medical transport for those in need. Find out more about at Goose Flights by going to PressBoxOnline.com slash Goose Flights. And uh, we continue to lift up and honor the uh, legacy of the great Tony Saragusa. And you can do so while also enjoying a delicious beer, Goose Flights Lager. All right. Um, we continue along here on a Tuesday edition of the program it's time. It's been too long since we've had an NFL draft segment. We just had a lot going on last week between baseball and basketball. Joining us now, this man has been one of the most accurate mock drafters in modern history. He plies his wares for the athletic. He is Mr. Ben Standig, and he is with us here on GCR. Ben, it's Glenn in Baltimore. It's great to chat with you, man. Thank you for taking the time for us. Yeah, no, thanks for having me on. Absolutely, Ben. It's interesting, and I don't want to just give away. We'll link up your mock draft on our Twitter account at Glenn Clark Radio. I hate just giving away the part that everybody here cares about, but I, I, let's talk about it. You have the Ravens trading out of the 30th pick, and you're not the first person that has suggested this to me. I'm guessing that's because you're looking and seeing that perhaps of the needs of the Ravens don't seem to fully mesh with what's likely to be available at 30 that might not still be available, say, early or midway through the second round? Yeah, you know, there's, you know, every year obviously is unique and different, so you can't just take a, a theory and I'll apply it every year. But in general, right, you know, I've often heard from you know, scouts and others that when you're talking like picks like 25 to 40, 45, something like that, not a ton of variance there like it's really like even like after like the top 15 or 20 is when it you know really starts becoming a sort of this more homogenized group so you know yeah whether you're you know a first round pick sounds great but is it really that much different than something you know 10 to 15 picks into the second round so yeah in the case here i had baltimore trading with <laughs> the my cover washington uh i swear that was not uh you know it was, it was all the up and up it wasn't just to get washington a second round pick um but um 
you know, and, and to drop down, obviously the Ravens have lost a lot of players this year in free agency. And so, you know, they got to fill in these holes while still trying to contend. So the deal gave them an extra third round pick. And, you know, like I said, if, if there's an offensive lineman there that, that they would like, obviously I can see them saying, nah, we're good. We'll take this guy, help protect Lamar and go from there. But, you know, if there's not somebody they're just dying to take, it just does feel to me like, that team in particular trading down, getting an extra pick, and then still taking advantage of that talent pool and that general, you know, 25 to 40 range would, would make a lot of sense. So let's let's give names to it because you do have the commanders then taking an offensive lineman at 30 and Tyler Guyton, and then two picks later the Chiefs taking one in Jordan Morgan from Arizona who's gotten a lot of conversation around the Ravens. But then, as you point out, you don't do the full, like, you know, two-round draft, but you then point out that you would have the Ravens taking um, – Oh, God, Kingsley. I believe it's Sua Mata Ia from BYU is um, who you had them taking. Why it, it, Why isn't the difference significant enough that it would be worth the Ravens themselves saying, hey, let's make sure we get one of these guys instead of dropping back? Yeah, for sure. I mean, like I said, they if their evaluation says these guys are too good, then, you know, you make the pick. Tyler Guyton's the guy, like, as we think we all probably know, um, this is a year that's considered to be very strong with the tackles. But that strength is sort of in the first round or, or in that top, you know, 30 to 45 range. Um, a lot of mock drafts will have Guyton going, you know, as high as maybe 20. Um, so if he's there and, and the Ravens think he is worthy, you know, and maybe even a little bit of a, a steal there, Go ahead and, and, and take the guy. Now, I, am I sitting here telling you there's going to be Guyton there at 30? No. I, I just think, like, there's a lot of tackles. Somebody is probably likely to fall to the back of the first round simply by, you know, the math. Like, not every team is taking a tackle, even if a lot of them are. So he was the one I had dropped to that range. Um, you know, Jordan Morgan, some people think maybe he might be more guard than tackle, but obviously he's another name who is there in that bottom first to early second. Um, the BYU kid, um, you know, he is typically re- viewed below those other names. But uh, my coll- colleague at the Athletic, Bruce Feldman, every year before the college football season does this freak list, just as the most outrageous athletes playing college football. And, and uh, Kingsley was one of those guys, just, you know, absurd size, <laughs> runs at absurd speed. So I think there's a lot of interesting traits with him. You know, again, do, do the Ravens or other teams think, you know, there is a gap, a, 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 not a big of enough of a gap to, to trade down in that scenario. We'll see. But in terms of the potential, from what I gather, where I've seen him projected generally, where um, you know he seems to be in relation to those uh, other tackles we just mentioned, I don't, I don't think it's that insane to drop off. And then you know, again, you get the extra, you get the extra pick. But you know, each team has their own unique circumstance. You guys would know better than I would yeah. in terms of you know where the Ravens are at in terms of what they think they already, who they have that can step in and, and, and so on. But, you know, again, I think that extra pick for a team that just lost so much this in free agency I get you know, it. kind of makes sense if you can still get someone. I totally, I totally get it. Ben Standing from The Athletic with us here on GCR. Ben, do any of these guys profile uniquely as future left tackles but maybe not left tackle on day one? Like the Ravens did decide to keep Ronnie Stanley around. Um, the needs are now right tackle or guard. Do you look at any of these guys that we're talking about and say, this is the guy that I would bet my house on is a quality left tackle down the road, but doesn't demand being a left tackle in, in season one? Yeah, well, I think the kid, uh, Fashanu from Penn State, you know, he seems to be the one. He's often being viewed as like the number two or three tackle to come off the board, but I also think he's viewed as a guy that needs some work. Um, he is, from you know, I'm talking to some people, viewed as a guy who's a legit left tackle. Everybody else, it feels like, okay, maybe, but not, like, automatically. It's not, you know, the, 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 you wouldn't think sometimes, like, what's the difference between the left and the right? But, you know, these uh, <laughs> years, no of, yeah. Of, uh, educa- yeah, years of education that show some guys just can't do it. So it doesn't seem like there's a ton of, of guys that, that – uh, are being viewed as longer-term left tackles among these guys. But, you know, like a guy like Guyton, who I'm saying, you know, in this mock would be there at 30 if Ravens kept the pick. You know, from what I could tell, I think there's some hope he could be a guy that can play both sides. He did in college a bit, more right than left. But, you know, the fact that he did play some on the left, I think he has some hope that that's, that's something he can he can do. And obviously this is also where you get on your coaching staff. 
is such a huge factor, right? I mean, how, how well does your team uh, help these guys out? You know, I would say, you know, from Washington's perspective the last few years, there weren't a ton of guys that, you know, they drafted <laughs> some players in the middle <laughs> rounds. They just weren't a ton of guys who developed yeah. into pieces. So that's it's always a huge key that we probably just generally don't talk about enough. Ben, the other area that appears to be the biggest area of need for the Ravens is at edge rush. Um, it, is there – I think we're all assuming that Chop Robinson is off the board. You have Darius Robinson off the board as well. Um, is there anyone, like, after that that would make sense at 30, or is that a case of, no, it would make more sense, again, if you trade out of the 30th pick and you're picking in the second round? Sure. So, just again, just to sort of use my – thoughts on how I'm viewing it from the Washington perspective, because it's kind of the same deal. They have an early pick in the second, you know, obviously Washington is picking number two overall. They're not going to take an edge rusher. I think we know what they're going to do, at least positionally. So then it's like, okay, well, what do they do with edge rush? And they had to fill in their rotation in free agency with like sort of a lot of just random uh, veterans who are, who are fine to fill in the gap times, but nobody all that. And I think the reason they did that was that I think they see, this is my assumption, that when they're picking at that top of the second, it really does kind of fall off from the options you have. Uh, you know, I think this guy like Braylon Trice from Washington, I saw him play live this yeah. year. I thought he was pretty good, but it doesn't seem like he's late first, top of the second. Uh, you know, I, I think there are some guys there. Uh, uh, Marshall Kneelan from Western Michigan, I like him. I don't know that he's, again, that range. That's probably it's way too aggressive for him. So I think there's some guys maybe it's in like, you know, later in round two or early round three that from a value perspective seems to be more in line with my sense of that Washington to get an edge rusher possibly early in the second but it does feel like he's like sort of athletically tested himself into round one so yeah I think at, at, at 30 or early second again you can take whomever and they may just dis- they may have different opinions but it doesn't there's not like a, sort of an abundance of options there it does feel like that's more of a later day two situation so it does. Again, it keeps feeding back to the idea that like it would make sense to try to acquire a pick and get a comparable player at that point. Um, I, ben, I, the Ravens have a reputation, and it's certainly, you know, you keep referencing uh, the time that you spend around Washington. It's it's a very different reputation, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, um, sure. it, they have a reputation of guys just kind of falling to them, and it's not always the case. And they've had plenty of picks that didn't work out. But there's also a number of times where everybody says, oh, Kyle Hamilton's about to be a Raven. Huh. How did that happen? And, and obviously the Ravens have reaped the benefits as he looks like an absolute superstar. Um, is there someone that you look at in this first round and say, this guy, maybe people are confused about exactly where he goes, but the talent is still kind of undeniable. And if we're waking up the morning after draft and saying, you know, it happened for the Ravens again, it's because this guy fell to them, and whether or not it was necessarily their biggest need, they said, we've got to grab this guy because he's sitting there at 30, and it worked out for the Ravens. Yeah, sure. I totally get it. Uh, yeah, I think a guy like uh, a couple defensive backs come to mind, uh, Cooper DeJean, the yeah. kid out of Iowa. Some see him as a corner. Some see maybe perhaps more of a of, of a safety, but like the competitiveness, uh, the, the, the talent, the versatility is pretty, you know, uh, pretty strong from what from evaluators I've talked to. I think the question just is, you know, in a year where quarterbacks and offensive tackles and you know some receivers maybe get you know get bumped up in the first round, some other positions of course are going to flip, and he may be the kind of a guy that uh, ends up dropping a bit. And you know, I, I, you know, I, I would think corner is a space where uh, where Baltimore could go, and he seems like the kind of guy that could be there. Um, Kool Aid Kool Aid McKinstry, obviously an amazing name. Yeah. Uh, the cornerback uh, from Alabama is another one where you know, in in doing these mocks, I didn't I did not include him in the first round, but he was like pick you know, thirty three. Like I could have put him in there anywhere in the last three or four picks and didn't. And you know, again, I just think that's a position that maybe gets pushed down a little bit. You know, I I think the, the defenders in general, right? There may not be a defensive player pick in the first seven picks based on how most projections are. And that, and you know, maybe only one of the top 10 or, or 11. So I think defenders in general are probably going to slip. And some of these defensive backs feel like some prime candidates uh, to get a, a really good value for sure. 
Um, and anything, you know, the, I don't think the Ravens are going to go early and wide receiver again. I just don't. I, I, I think they've done it a lot, and they're going to try to make things work with Rashad Bateman, and they've got two really good tight ends. But the one thing that you would say the Ravens are missing as far as the receiver room is concerned is, like, the prototype wide receiver, the 6'4", the, the bigger catch radius, that type of guy. Is there anyone that, again, could be in that mix that might fit that unique type of bill that we're talking about? Yeah, the, I mean, the, the one name that comes to mind is a kid, uh, Donnie Mitchell. Mitchell yeah. um, he, he's got that big size. Um, he's got first-round buzz going on. And, um, you know, there are some teams there, you know, depending, like Arizona, potentially at, at 27, depending on what they do. Earlier on, um, you know, I don't know, is Kansas City get get aggressive, try to trade up, uh, you know, knowing seeing how you know, they won a Super Bowl, but their receivers were were kind of rough. Does Buffalo feel the need to acquire somebody else, having lost Gabe Davis, their you know sort of bigger version? You know, I think those are teams that could be in play there. But yeah, he could be absolutely be there at thirty. Um, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm thinking general for me. Look, every team needs. The big play receiver, we all get that. Yep. But I think it's personally, I think there's just too much investment sometimes in that position. It's important, but like it's the, you know, on offense, it's the furthest away from the actual ball all the time. You're not involved, you know, if you're running the ball half the time, which obviously the Ravens run a lot, yep. you're not even involved in the play too much other than as a blocker. And you can, every draft, the receiver room, the receiver class is one of the stronger ones, meaning you can typically find help in, you know, later rounds. So, you know, to me, I would wait, but. You got to have that player. You want that. You want that game-breaking ability. Totally get it. So, and you know, third and seven. Who's the guy you're throwing it to? You want that guy with size, like you're talking about. So, I totally get it. And if you know, if that's somebody they would be interested in, then I think Mitchell could be a pretty uh, good pick for them. Uh, it, it's so Ben. Every year, somebody tries to tell me, I don't think this is a good receiver class. I'm like, yeah, I heard that two years ago. Let's go back and look and see the ten receivers that have all been really good uh, football players that came out of that. Like, it's hilarious to me. Every time the year the Ravens took uh, Hollywood Brown, and then you look and you're like, oh, well, look, Debo Samuel was right after that. And Terry McLaurin seems like he's pretty good. Man, the list goes on. Um, ben, I always appreciate it. Uh, I know, of course, The Athletic is where people can find your stuff. And on Twitter, uh, they can give you a follow, at Ben Standig. I ask this, do you feel pressure this time of year because of your reputation for being so good with the mock drafts? Do you start to feel like, oh, God, I can't screw this up. Everybody thinks I'm going to go like 30 for 32? Uh, I don't think my family is aware that I even do mock drafts, <laughs> and most of my colleagues don't think I can, you know, tie my own shoelaces. So, no, not, not too bad. There's people on Twitter who are kind about it, and, you know, when we get to the actual contest, uh, you know, and maybe that day I'm like, oh, boy, I hope I'd always, you know, completely botch this, this thing. But, uh, you know, you do the best you can. I will say this. I Washington picks two. I do feel pressure on that. I can't. Yeah, be a, sure. That's a good point, a right? Draft guy and get the get the second picker on. Yeah, <laughs> and obviously there's a lot of question about that at the moment. Ben, appreciate it, man. Thanks for taking the time for us. We'd love to do this again. Yeah, anytime. Thanks a lot. It's Ben Standig uh, from the Athletic with us here for our NFL draft segment. Yeah, he I, he kills um, as far as his accuracy is concerned in mock drafts, and um, you know. Nobody wants to hear it. It's I always talk about this as a draft. Nobody likes the thought of trading out of the pick. We all get the together. We all and maybe we'll go to an event this year. I don't know. Everybody's especially when you're you know a team like the Ravens and you're picking late to begin with, and everybody's been watching the draft all night, and then all of a sudden you get there and it's like it's better recently, I guess. Of what do you mean? I feel like timing wise, like it hasn't. Come oh, the draft has definitely late. moved at a at a more reasonable pace, and the Ravens. When was the last year the Ravens didn't pick in the first round? God, we gotta go back a ways. Like it has been a long time now. Hang on a second, Ravens. Um, yeah, they've. I feel like they always have. Uh, well, no, they haven't always. During mm. in the early Harbaugh years, My, there uh, were there were yeah. a couple of years in there where like Sergio Kindle 16. was their first pick in the sixteen with Stanley. Yeah, so. Uh, 15 would have been 15 would have been no. yeah 15 okay. would have been Perriman yeah 100% 14 was Mosley yeah Mosley so thir- Elam oh wow that's right 13 yeah. was Elam and 12 would have been no 12 was the last time they didn't have a first round pick okay 12 was the last time they didn't have a first round pick because 2012 they took oh god 
They both ended up stinking in the second round. Well, no, oh, Semele they took in the second round. And he was serviceable. The other guy, who was the other guy they took in 12? Um, Courtney Upshaw. Thank you. God, Courtney Upshaw. You want 100%. to run you into the rest of the 2012 draft class? No chance. Do Zero chance. I can't. If you told me, like, the school, then maybe I could tell you who the player was. But I can't remember after that. Um, we had – we have the school? Okay, all right. So, Courtney Upshaw was Alabama. Assembly was Iowa State. Yeah. And they took a Temple kid in round three. Uh, running well, back. It, yeah, I was going to say, it wasn't Tavon Young, so it had to be Bernard Pierce. It was Bernard Pierce. Yeah. Delaware, an offensive lineman. Oh, Gino. Yeah, Gino. Greg Kowski. Um, and they went defensive back in the fourth and fifth round from one from South Carolina State. And then one from uh, Cal Poly. Is there a difference between Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo? Well, that's Cal Poly. Okay. Um, that is Asa Jackson. Yes, Cal Poly Asa Jackson. I got to know Asa. Great guy. Um, I do not remember that. I thought this guy was a running back. South Carolina State? Yeah. Yeah, Christian Thompson. Oh, CT. Uh, really? I, he was friendly with um, Ed Reed and Ed Reed's crew. Um, so, like, Glenn Eunice introduced me to CT at one point. And um, nice kid. Nice kid. I don't remember anything about him as a football player. Like, nothing at all. <laughs> but nice kid. Wide receiver in round six out of Miami, Florida. Oh, that I actually do know was Tommy Streeter. It was Tommy so Streeter. that was I was obsessed with Tommy Streeter, and I was obsessed with um, Aaron Millette out of Elon. They were both six five. They were both uh, big, and I I kept asking for the Ravens to try to find a big target. Um, yeah, he obviously he did nothing. Although I believe he had a, a a big training camp. I believe they both had big training camps, and we started to buy into them as being things. Twenty eleven was a good class. Oh. I think. Yeah, Are we yeah, just doing this instead of tidbit today? Um, I guess we could. Did we cool. finish 2012 uh, yet? D'Angelo Tyson was drafted in the seventh well, round. Well, if you had told me a defensive tackle out of Georgia, I probably no. would have gotten D'Angelo Tyson. Sorry. He was actually kind of a half a player for a minute, D'Angelo Tyson. Do you want to do 2011 or not? Yeah. How many 2011s? Well, 2011 is Tory and Jim, one Jimmy and Jimmy and Tory Smith were the first two picks. Correct. Um, after that, I don't. I mean, give me the. Again. Uh, third round was a tackle from UCF. Oh, that's Ja Reed. It was as, ja uh, as Eunice used to say, where is Ja? Where is Ja? Uh, then another receiver in round four. Another Big Ten wide receiver. Big Ten wide receiver. Big Ten. I guess I guess Chip Torrey Smith was in ACC at the time, so not not another Big Ten wide receiver. That's true. Uh, Big Ten wide receiver. Big Ten wide receiver. Oh, that's Tana Doss, it of course. Tana. Tana I loved so. I used to do the combine every year. And um, one year, I'm going through, there's a mall in downtown Indianapolis, and I'm on an elevator, and I just look over, and on the elevator going the other way, there's Tandon Dawes. And uh, we ended up hanging out for a little while. That, I mean, I, I we had always gotten along with Tandon. Remember, Tandon Dawes famously was, like, people said Joe Flacco picked Tandon Dawes because the Ravens, like, gave, uh, involved Joe Flacco in the conversation. And after the draft, they brought up, like, Joe really liked Tandon Doss. Obviously, it never worked out that much, but... Um, did Tandon Doss do anything? No. Uh, then no. They he was on the Super Bowl team, though. Two so round, he's, he's got a ring. Two fifth-round picks. Oh. A DB and a defensive end. One from Texas, one from Mississippi State. Oh, Purnell. Purnell McPhee. Purnell McPhee. Was, oh, yeah, it was actually obviously. back to back. Pick 164 and 165. So right before Purnell McPhee. <sighs> defensive back, you said? From Texas. Oh, Shockey Brown. It was. Shockey Brown. Yeah. Love Shockey. Uh, it's another good dude. Really like Shockey Brown. Round six, they took a Virginia Tech player, a quarterback. Oh, Tyrod. Yeah. Tyrod Taylor. Taylor. Tyrod right. Taylor. And then in the seventh round, a running back from Georgia Tech. Anthony Allen. It was Anthony, Anthony Allen. Allen. You're, getting, you're pretty good at this. Well, this is when I was covering the team, man. Yeah, like, this right. is so these. This is, these. this is my wheelhouse. You know what I mean? Like, this is – if I don't get these – all Shameful. Right, 2010. I forgot. All right. We're it's the last one. Then we got to take a break. <laughs> they did not have a first round pick in 2010. So then it was Sergio and Terrence Cody yes. in the second round? Yes, it was. Be. <laughs> like, every time somebody talks about Ravens draft history, you go back to that round. Terrence, sure. Terrence Cody had a moment maybe always, where he looked yeah, like I a football player. Like oh, I remember. Right? I Terrence Cody was okay, cool so I, I think I can say this now. I, I had information that the Ravens loved Sergio Kendall. 
I I had from someone who mattered. That's all I can say. I I was to understand the Ravens love Sergio Kendall. What nobody will remember because of the fame the story Sergio Kendall drives his car into a house or something like that. Sergio Kendall was thought of as being like a top twenty player in that draft. So I remember the morning of that draft saying I was confident. The two things that I was confident in going into that draft. It's the only year I would ever tell you I had definitive actual information about what the Ravens were going to do in the draft or they wanted to do in the draft. And the two things I said that morning when Drew and I did our whatever dumb segment were one. It was a great segment. I was confident the Ravens were trading out of the pick and that the only way they weren't trading out of the pick is if somehow Sergio Kindle fell to them. I don't remember what the original pick would have been that year. Um, so I remember saying both of those things, and then we didn't know. Like, it was so befuddling. I Like, I remember that night from the facility, like, in the infancy of Twitter, talking about how crazy it was that the draft is working out that they were going to be able to take Sergio Kendall with their pick. And then... It was pick uh, 43. No, the original pick. Oh, the original, the original pick. pick. Oh. I don't remember oh, where 50, it was. It was 57 in round two. So they weren't originally in... So they, if it was fifty, back. you're saying if they they had the fifty seventh pick, y- yeah. So then they probably had the twenty fifth yeah, pick. The, yes, they had the twenty fifth. The twenty fifth pick in round one, and I couldn't believe that it was working out for them that Sergio Kindle fell to them at twenty five. I was like, this is unbelievable. They're going to take Sergio Kindle. So then they traded out of the pick, and then I was antsy because I couldn't believe that the person that gave me the information that they love Sergio Kindle led me astray. Now I still look smart. Because I said they're either going to trade out of the pick or they're going to take Sergio Kendall. But ultimately, they did both. And so it's like the greatest call that I've ever had in my... Like, in in reporting, I that was factual information. That was not me guessing or saying, hey, it would make sense for them to take so-and-so. I had been told declaratively that they loved Sergio Kendall, but they wanted to trade out of the first round. So, so they traded that the twenty number twenty five for a second, a third, and a fourth from Denver okay. on draft night, and that was because a month earlier they had traded three, two or three picks for Anquan Bolden. Uh, two, but they, they, none of them were top. Were yeah, they, were, they yeah, weren't? They, were really, they uh, weren't yeah, first they were round picks. They were, yeah. yeah. So, okay. Um, and then obviously you know the Sergio Kindle thing. Very, they're not really unfortunate. It's a sad story. Like looking back on it, because he was an unbelievably talented player coming out of uh, college. All right. Um. Rest of that draft? Third round. Uh, they actually went tight, tight end in the third and fourth round. Oh, uh, yeah. Ed Dixon and Dennis Pitta. Yes. Yeah, uh, of course. It was Dixon first, then Pitta. Yes. Then wider. So it seems like whenever they take a tight end, uh, the second guy always like is slightly That's a better. good point, right? Hayden Hurst and Mark Andrews, yeah. obviously. That's fair. Uh, wide receiver. Although I don't, I don't want to be disrespectful to Ed. Ed, Ed yeah, yeah, no. Ed, well, Ed, Ed Dixon, like, eh, Ed Dixon, Ed Dixon gets good. so overlooked because of what he didn't become, and like he looked like a specimen. Like you looked at Ed Dixon, like a lot of people might know. I was very close with Ed Dixon. Ed Dixon, you know, I would almost say we were friends. Six, like you weren't supposed to be. Six four two fifty. That he looked like. I, 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 every time we would talk about Ed Dixon, Ed Dixon, I'd be like, "This is the guy that's primed to break out." And he had a couple of drops. As a blocking tight end, Ed Dixon was as good as there was. Like, Ed Dixon, the way that we talked about Nick Boyle as a blocking tight end, Ed Dixon was that caliber of a blocking tight end. And he'll always go down as technically having been the starting tight end in Super Bowl 35. Four, five, nine, four for Ed Dixon. Ed Dixon was... Here's the problem. Ten on the wonder list. That makes no sense. (laughs) Ed was a really smart... Ed also... (laughs) Man, this is a funny thing about Ed. So Ed did a lot of events with him. He was a great guy. Ed and Arthur Jones were like my two guys that I was probably closest with from that. And they were also very close friends. So like we all, Ed did a lot of events with us and got to know my now wife and like would give me crap every day. When are you going to propose, bro? When are you going to ask her to marry you? Like every, he'd see me in the locker room every day. And then he'd start like grabbing other dudes. Like this guy's got to, a gorgeous girlfriend. And look at him, man. Like he, Glenk, what are you doing, man? Propose, <laughs> propose already. Lock that down. Ed would give me crap all the time. 
And then he would try to say it in other ways. He'd be like, because he, you know, he, I think already had his, famously his son was born. They played a game against the Jets on Monday Night Football. His son, his first son was born the same day. And I remember he got engaged and he was like, because that's what you, like, like he said it in front of a group of people. Like I think somebody asked him about getting engaged. He was like, because that's what you do when you have a wonderful woman that loves you. And he like turns and he like looks at me in the middle of like a press gaggle. And he's like, Glenn. listen to him earlier i, I guess, guess i guess i guess maybe it wouldn't have changed anything. i guess well we got we, we yes everything life turned out fine for mrs clark and uh, I. so you got arthur jones there are two more oh arthur jones right was in that group two others in that group another fifth or so arthur jones was the s- again they had back-to-back fifth round picks here one 156 and 157 they took one pick before arthur jones a wide receiver from utah oh david reed yep david, david reed. reed was more of a return guy than he was a wide receiver uh and then from morehouse college Ramon Harewood. Ramon Harewood. I probably could do 09, too. I probably could do, because these are all the years when I was covering, like, really covering the team. I could probably do 09, maybe 08, but I don't I don't know. I mean, We've got to keep going, I guess. No, it's 12-17. We still have to Trump take one pick, more. You should know. Uh, Michael Orr. Michael yeah, Orr. Michael Orr. Followed by in the second round. Paul Kruger. Yes. Paul Kruger. Also at pick 57 overall. Huh, how about that? Uh, third round pick. I might. Oh, it was a good player, wasn't it? Yes. Was that Webby? It was. Yeah, Webby. It's Webb from Nicholas. Webby called in to. I was doing live draft coverage on the radio station that year, and he called. I I guess I don't know how I, because it was so random. Like this is before we had put on like all the prospects ahead of the draft, but I just like called down. Nichols was a small enough school. That I, I don't know if it was Chris Benetti or somebody who was producing the show that day. I was like, just call this guy from Nichols. And like within five minutes, they had Webb on the phone with us on the radio. It was great. The, then they didn't have a fourth. They had two fifth round picks. I don't recognize either of these guys. Maybe, maybe I should. Uh, tell me the position uh, or the, no, the school. Oh, TCU. Um, linebacker. Maybe I. TCU linebacker. It was Jason Phillips who had a bad knee and was, was going to be a higher pick. He was a guy that was going to be. Like a second or a third round pick, but he fell because of his knee injury. Yes, Jason. Yeah, it didn't really turn out to be a player. Uh, and then a tight end from Eastern Carolina. East Carolina is Devon Drew. Yeah. And then in the sixth round, a a uh, running back. Uh, Damian. No, he was undrafted. Damian Barry, running back. Virginia. Oh, you know what? It, he wasn't really a, Cedric Pierman, no. but he was what a was he? he was a special teams guy. Oh, okay. He was and like an ace. Um, the day Anthony Levine retired, he said like one of the most special texts he got was from Cedric Pierman, who was like revered as a special teams guy in football. Like he was a a, a, spe- a special teams had a hell of a career as a special teams dude, but never. I don't think he ever played in Baltimore. I think they released him before the season, and he played the bulk of his career in Cincinnati. Two thousand eight was a big draft. Yeah, Flacco and Rice. Um, oh God, who else was in that? Flacco and Rice, then... Wow, they did, I mean, they had 10, 1, 2, 3, Jesus. 5. Jesus. Well, remember, yeah, they were really picks. bad in 07. They needed... Yeah, they were. <laughs> um, Flacco and Rice. They had three... Wow, they had five picks between the third and fourth round. Was that the Zibikowski nakamura year? Mm-hmm. They got both those guys? Tom I, Zibikowski. I love... Those are two of my favorite dudes. In the third round? Yeah. Not their first third round pick, though. Not their first third round Rookie pick. Rookie Nakamura in the sixth round. I quickly, come on, we can't. We can't. We're a th- linebacker this is from ridiculous. Miami, Florida. Oh, Tavares. Yeah, Tavares Gooden. Tavares Gooden, uh, a yeah. tackle from UTEP. I don't remember. Uh, O'Neal. Oh, O'Neal Cousins. O'Neal Son of a Cousins. bitch. Yeah. Yeah. Wide receiver out of New Mexico. Oh, that was uh, another guy that was really a special teams guy. Marcus Smith was the wide receiver out of New Mexico. Tackle from Weber State. Also, does not ring a bell. David Hale. David Hale. I, okay, vaguely. And then uh, wide receiver. Oh, yeah. Here, here we go. From uh, Virginia Tech. That's Justin Harper. Justin, yeah, Harper. I love Justin. Har- like Justin Harper was one of the guys that like would go out of his way to come chat with me. And I remember when Tyrod got drafted, he was still on the practice squad, and like he would rave about. He like was the wide receivers coach all four years while I was at Towson. Oh, was he? Yeah, he was yeah awesome. I love Justin Harper. Yeah. Great guy. Great uh, guy. And then running back from Oklahoma in also in round seven. 
Patrick. Does it ring a bell? Alan Patrick. Alan Patrick. All right. I vaguely remember that. All right. I don't know why we did this exercise, but it was fun. <laughs> it was fun for me. Out, well, the last time anyway. they didn't have a first-round yeah, first pick. pick. That's right. It did happen twice in like a three-year span, and then it hasn't happened since. Ben Grubbs in 07, Yaman Figures, Marshall Yonda. I was in Arizona at this point. I don't remember. Le'Ron McLean in the fourth I was round. doing live draft coverage on 1060, the KDUS, or in, uh, the fan 1060 in uh, Phoenix. And I don't remember who I wanted in that draft, but it wasn't Ben Grubbs. And I remember, like, my reaction was inappropriate for the fact that I was doing, like, Cardinals-based draft coverage. Like, we we would take the podium for every pick. Like, now let's go to the podium. And they, like, announced Ben Groves. Well, around that area was Joe Staley one pick before. Uh, definitely Greg wanted. Greg Olson was the 31st pick. Oof, oof. <laughs> this is a. The Ravens had Grubbs at a twenty. Ben Grubbs is a good player. Yeah, he was. That's the, dis- like, that's the bummer about that. Ben Grubbs is a good player. Do you remember Craig Davis? Buster Davis, a hundred percent. I remember Buster, Buster Davis. Davis. I sure do. Why was he LSU, right? Yes. Yeah. He went one pick after Ben Grubb. Yeah. Uh, um, I absolutely was high on Buster Davis. Anthony Got Anthony Gonzalez from the uh, to the Colts, pick. right? Yes. Yeah. Um, let's see who else was around here. Kevin Cobb was uh, early in the second round. I, uh, Eric Weddle went in early in the second. Maybe round. Maybe I wanted Cobb because th- remember that was in the the was weird Cobb or Cobb. Cobb. Oh. Cobb. And it was in that weird time where you knew McNair wasn't going to be around for a long time, and so you wanted to think about your quarterback of the future, maybe. I don't remember who he – but I – my reaction to Ben Grubbs being the pick was inappropriate and worse because, like, I was doing radio in Phoenix. Nobody in Phoenix gave a rat's ass. Who did the, the Cardinals take in that draft? The was Cardinals that – Cardinals had the fifth overall Was that Levi? It was was that Levi who it was? Brown. Yeah. And remember, everybody wanted Joe Thomas. He went third. Yeah. He went third. And so the Cardinals just took, like, the next tackle on the board. Kind of worry. Raiders took Jamarcus Russell at first. Ted Ginn was in that draft, if I remember correctly, because yes. that was – overall pick. One of my co-hosts was like, if they don't get Joe Thomas, they should take Ted Ginn. And – Adrian Peterson went pick seven. Nah, that, that one would have been pretty good. That one would have been. Marshall good. Lynch was. All right, we got to take a break, man. We got. We can't do this all day. Brandon Merriweather. This is the portion of the program. Remember that tweet? <laughs> Boys can just be happy naming guy. I mean, naming, I can look at every single naming. NFL draft. We would just, <laughs> and it would be totally fine for us. Sydney Rice. All we wanted to pick do. forty-four. All right, all right, all right. We got to wrap. Smith, uh, we got to wrap Giants, up, man. Giants, Steve Smith. Today's show also brought to you by your local Toyota dealer, buyatoyota.com, proud sponsor of County Sports Zone, where you get all of the latest on uh, spring sports at the high school level, boys and girls lacrosse, softball, baseball, the whole thing. Jacoby Jones went on one pick before Yaman figures. <laughs> How about that? How about that? We'll come back in and I, I guess not really do tidbit and tubular <laughs> or yeah, wrap things up. It's Glenn Clark Radio. The ultimate fan experience awaits you at Sports and Social Maryland. See how we're raising the sports bar with our massive 100-foot media wall featuring 40 HD TVs and a 47-foot big screen. Bet on your favorite teams and this year's biggest events at the FanDuel Sportsbook while enjoying your favorite beers and cocktails, plus our delicious takes on bar food classics. Visit Sports and Social at Live Casino in Hotel Maryland. At Arundel Mills, must be 21. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Hungry? With seven locations throughout Maryland, Maryland, Glory Days Grill is always right around the corner. They have wings, burgers, salads, sandwiches, and drinks to satisfy everyone, as well as tons of televisions and sound delivered right to your phone. Glory Days is the best place to watch football or whatever your favorite sport is. While you're there, be sure to check out Goose Flights Lager, named in honor of legendary Raven Tony Goose Siragusa. $2 of every can is donated to the Goose Flights Foundation. Glory Days Grill, great food, good sports. Why bet with the big boys this football season? Instead, try your hand with the local book, Superbook Sports, this fall. Superbook Sports is the book next door. Just a dedicated team of the best odds makers in Las Vegas, making sure you get the best prices and parlays anywhere. And now, Superbook will give you a bonus of up to $250 when you sign up and wager on the same day and use the promo code GlennClark23, G-L-E-N-N-C-L-A-R-K-2-3. So bet with the best and use the promo code GlennClark23 this football season with Superbook Sports. Visit Superbook.com for terms and conditions. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Six chicken tenders made from fresh, never-frozen Royal Farms world-famous chicken, a family-sized order of Western fries, honey mustard dipping sauce, and a two-liter bottle of Dr. Pepper. It's Royal Farms' new Tucker's Tenders Meal. It's Justin Tucker's favorite, and at only $19.99, it'll be your favorite meal, too. The new Tucker's Tenders Meal, available
available only at Royal Farms. Now you can kick back, relax, and eat like a champion. Real fresh, real fast, Royal Farms. The Toyota Tacoma comes in a range of models and trim lines, so you can choose the perfect Tacoma to reflect your unique personality and driving habits. Check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new Tacomas from your local Toyota dealer today. Gambling can be a fun and entertaining experience, but there are risks involved. If you're planning on betting on the game at the casino or on your phone or computer, know your limit, stay within it. Set a budget and a time to stop. Remember, gambling isn't a financial solution and it doesn't mix well with alcohol or drugs. Know the risks and have a plan before you begin gambling. For free and confidential services, call 1-800-GAMBLER 24-7 or go to helpmygamblingproblem.org. Jeremy Kahn here. The ultimate sports betting experience in Maryland is at the Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbook. Join me at either location in Canton or in Towson and place your bets in person and be a part of the action. It's the best in-class sports wagering experience complete with the ultimate TV package, ensuring you can catch every game all day, every day. Their state-of-the-art facilities bring Las Vegas energy right here to Maryland just in time for postseason football. So visit the Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbook in Canton and Towson and elevate your game day experience and hang out with me to bet, watch, and win at the Turtle. What company has the expertise to make your home healthier by purifying your air and killing all viruses, allergens, and bacteria? A.J. Michaels, Heating and Air Conditioning in Baltimore and Annapolis, ajmichaels.com. Coming back in here with Glenn and the other guy, uh, uh, Garrett, whatever his name is. You know who they are. All right, winding down on a Tuesday edition of the program, um, the Orioles have decided that the, to cancel the fan rally and po- open workout to the public tonight um, in the aftermath of the, the tragic news today. And I certainly get it. It's, it's, it just feels awkward. It feels awkward doing anything that's light and fun. And it, it's just a tough, it's a tough feeling. So I get it. Uh, I certainly understand that. So if you were making plans to uh, go down to the ballpark tonight, um, they will not be doing the public workout. Um, as of right now, the game is still scheduled for Thursday. We've all been looking at the forecast. My guess is that tomorrow afternoon, if they're going to make a decision, it would come tomorrow afternoon that they want to have a 24-hour notice, but they want to wait until within 24 hours in order to make a decision to let the models kind of play out as much as possible to have a feel for what the weather is going to do. It would be better for me, I think, I think it'd be better for me if it would stayed on Thursday. I would prefer it to stay on Thursday, even though we got to go down to the uh, the casino afterwards. I got a lacrosse game Friday night, so that would make it far more difficult for me. I'd have to leave like in the sixth inning on Friday if um, the game stays then. So let's root for the uh, the the forecast to change in the next twenty four hours. We're not gonna do tidbit because we basically did it. But I can give you the trivia questions from trivia last okay. night. I had one more from like the tournament over the weekend that I missed. Uh, all right. Quick one. Uh, that'll be brought we to you by that'll be brought to you by Atmans. The new Atmans Harbor Point is open and is awesome. Everything you love about Atmans, the corned beef piled high, the hand rolled bagels, the delicious soups, it's all available at Atmans Harbor Point. Plus they have a full bar. Atmansdeli.com is the website. That's the only thing it's brought to you by. You got it. You really got it. We oh, okay. we yeah. Like it's let's let's um we'll do it after tidbit. All okay. right. Um, tri- go ahead. Fine. Go ahead. Donovan Klingon had a great game on uh, Sunday at 14 points, 14 rebounds, and 8 blocks. That last time that that has been done in the tournament was 1986 by... It was done by this Navy basketball player. No, David Robbins. David Robbins. Yeah, okay. 14, 14, 8 blocks. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Pretty remarkable. Um, Last night at Trivia... We technically won, but it's it's there's a caveat to it. Um, sports questions. Well, one, uh, what what basketball player was nicknamed the Ice Man? It's bad. George Gervin. Oh. George Gervin, Hall of Famer. George Gervin is the Ice Man. Um, name the four number one seeds in the NCAA tournament this year. Yeah. Houston. Yeah. Purdue. Uh huh. Yeah. And then it should have been. Mm, just say just say it. Carolina. Thank you. So we finished tied. Was that one that you could wager on or was that one? Uh, no, that was a 
Just an a in-between question. We finished tied for first. So we got the five bonus points, but there was a bonus question to determine who got the $30 gift card and who got the $20 gift card. And um, I, I think there were some shenanigans afoot involved with this. The question was how many career how many points did George Gervin score in his career? And they told us we had to answer like immediately. They were like, right. The uh, other team did not answer immediately. I just wrote down the first number that came to mind and like took it up. Seven thousand. You you gave half of the guess that I gave. Okay. I gave a guess of fourteen thousand. The number was twenty six thousand. The other team turned in a guess of twenty four thousand. I got some questions. I think some chicanery was afoot. When I had to turn, I did the first number that came into my mind. I had to race up there, and then I heard three times from the host, "We need your answer." Oh, yeah. They had they like, should. they had like well over a minute before they turned their answer in. They should have been disqualified because they didn't immediately turn it in as they were requested to do. I got. I think chic- I side with you. Here. Chicanery afoot. Yes. Chicanery. Yeah. We got a case. Not happy about it. All right. Uh, so, Jim, do you add ten dollars to the? Yeah, I think they should be willing to buy us a, a pretzel or something next week. All right, that was tidbit for today. Which well-oiled machine over here? Well-oiled Glenn Clark Radio machine. Have you ever thought of taking a cruise to these wonderful destinations with sunny skies and beautiful beaches? We'll wait no longer. We're ready for you to cruise from the Cruise Maryland Terminal. have a little uh, phrase that you can go from baggage to margarita in about 15 minutes. Choose fun with an array of destinations, onboard activities, entertainment, and world-class cuisine. Contact your travel agent and book your cruise today. Let your adventure begin. All right. And Tubular is brought to you today by Superbook, Superbook.com. Download the Superbook app. Use the code GlennClark23. When you sign up, you'll receive up to $250 on a same-day first bet match. Win or lose from Superbook. Um, Some odds boosts available tonight. You can bet the Warriors, the Lakers, and the Kings all just win outright. And the odds are boosted up to plus 1,400. For all th- I don't even know who they're playing. Um, you could boost uh, the Birds of a Feather, the Pelicans, the Penguins, and the Ducks to all win the night. Those odds boosted up to plus 1420. So some fun odds boosts available for tonight at Superbook. Superbook.com. Download the Superbook app. Use the code GlennClark23. Um, not a whole lot is the answer for Tubular this evening. Um, Maryland baseball plays at Georgetown at four. No TV, no video this broadcast. Maryland baseball game. Well, they had two uh, walk-off, walk-off wins. Uh, the what's freshman. Braden Martin? I yes, believe is his Braden name. Martin. Walt I was Will- able to, able to check out uh, Sunday's game. Oh, how about that? Yeah. Very cool. Dropped you my sister off because she was oh, home she goes to school. Break, okay, so we dropped her off. Well, that's neat. Yeah. Do they charge admission or? Uh, I so we got there a little bit late. I'm not sure. if okay. they would charge the bit, not the entire game. They were charging. I was thinking about. We I would. I think we had ended up having something we had to do on Sunday. Okay. Oh, I wanted to be back to do it because uh, I was taking my parents to Frankie Valley. Mm. Um, but. I would like to get my boys to a Maryland baseball. Yeah, I took them to a Towson game. Was, the Sunday game was great because they, they went down. Um, they were, like, down 4-1, and they scored three in the bottom of the eighth. Mm-hmm. And then uh, came back and uh, were able to walk it off in the bottom of the tenth. Braden Martin is Walt Williams' nephew. Really? Yeah. So kind of a neat Maryland story there. Uh, anyway, they play Georgetown today at 4. You can listen to it on the Maryland Baseball Network, but unfortunately no video broadcast for the game. Uh, Capitals host the Red Wings tonight, 7 on Monumental, ESPN Plus, Cardinals Cubs at 3, Devils Maple Leafs at 7.30, that's also on Hulu, TNT Lakers Bucks at 7.30, Mavs Kings at 10, that one's also on True TV for some reason, um, NIT action on ESPN tonight, including uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in Indiana State against Cincinnati at 9, Georgia, Ohio State before that. Uh, the CBI semifinals on ESPN2, look man, everything else, GlennClarkRadio.com, Mi- Miami, Seattle, Tennessee, man. sure. Uh, what's coming up non-sports wise? Uh, there's not a there's not a ton. Uh, there is the so there's an Alex Jones documentary, The Truth versus Alex Jones on HBO at nine. Yeah, I'm good. So I'm good. We'll be diving into the Turn of the Frogs gay. They'll be diving into the the consp- his conspiracies and I'm, the I'm you know, good. Sandy Hook thing. So I'll, I'll choose not. That would be that. That is it. Yeah. All right. Very good. 
thanks today to uh, Patrick Stevens. Thanks to Ben Standig. Thanks to Eric Kratz and Wes Brown. We'll get all of it up in the greatest hits section of the. Oh my God, it's so good. Tab at GlennClarkRadio.com. Anything tomorrow? Uh, Drew will be here, and Randolph Childress will uh, join okay, us. Okay, well. we'll talk some NCAA tournament with him. Yeah. Stuff and things. Oh boy. Thanks to everybody at Press Box, all of our great sponsors and partners, including Roos Chris, Live Casino and Hotel, Atman's Deli, AJ Michaels, Guilford Hall Brewery, Royal Farms, Cruise MD, Casa Sin, Superbook Sports, Glory Days Grill, your local Toyota dealer, buyatoyota.com. Thanks to our heroes who are doing great work in our community today, um, and our thoughts continue to be with everyone who has been impacted by today's tragedy. Mm. Thanks to Griffin at Griffin underscore Bass. Follow us Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Glenn Clark Radio. Have a great Tuesday night. Go Maryland baseball. Duke sucks.